Hello, everybody, and welcome to the MinMax Show, a place about games, friends, getting better. I'm Ben Hansen, and I personally want to thank you for being here, for watching this, for listening to this. And I'm not alone in personally welcoming you, because I'm joined by Jeff Marchiafava. Hello, and thank you. There it is, everybody, as sincere as they come. Uh, we're also joined by Jenna Garcia. Yo, what's good? And Kyle Hilliard. Hello. Hello. We're going to start every episode of the podcast with a song now, so everybody buckle up. Um, not really. <laughs> this is a terrible the tone. Horse song? <laughs> it should be the horsey song. <laughs> uh, hey, on this episode of the podcast, it's going to be all about 2022 predictions. We're running through exactly what will happen this year, right, Jeffum? Correct. Take it to without a doubt, the bank. zero doubt, zero doubt allowed. If it's you less doubt, predictions you're out. and more just telling you what's about to happen. <laughs> That's right. It's exactly that. It's a premonition mm -hmm. podcast. Speaking of premonition, I have a, a great vision of the future, and it involves a deepest dive. Some would say. Uh, we should have announced it last week, but let's announce it uh, this week right now. We are officially taking the deepest dive into Pokemon Legends Arceus. We're going to tackle this sucker. We're going to see what it's all about. We're going to create the best, most thorough discussion about this game on the internet, but we can only do that with your help. So we're going to be playing through the game and we're looking for your comments along the way to help fuel our big discussion. We'll read them on air. So if you support us at any tier, even the $2 tier, you can spin a comment for us to read. Um, and clock is ticking because this game is coming out on Friday and we're going to be recording the deepest dive on uh, Tuesday. So we'll be collecting your comments on Monday the 31st. Everybody still with me? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Hey, there it is, everybody. Um, what we're doing is for these for, for the first discussion, we are covering everything in the game up through the first big boss fight. Which, if you're curious about exactly what that means, uh, we have a standalone video where I show what it is, but just in case people consider it a spoiler, it seems like the game will let you know that there is a big boss fight, there's a Pokemon that's causing trouble in the area. Once you take that thing out, that is the stopping point for the deepest dive. If you mainline it, we've been told that it's like one and a half hours. If you do all the side quests, it's about ten hours. So we figured that's a good stopping point for the first weekend of everybody diving into Pokemon Legends Arceus. And I'm not going to be alone, because I'm going to be joined by Janet Garcia. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, should be fun. Should be fun. Uh, Sarah Pozorski will be joining, and then also Kelsey Lewin. So basically the community question segment from last week's episode of the podcast, that's going to be the whole crew for the deepest dive on Pokemon Legends Arceus. Uh, but reviews are out. Kyle, what do you think about those Arceus reviews so far? Uh, th good, positive. Yeah. Right? Like a, like kind of like around like the mid-8, eight, 8 level, which like makes me, it's like, all right, cool. It's like the first entry, sort of, you know, in this new version of Pokemon, so... Looks like maybe it's, you know, not perfect, which is to be expected, but, like, there's enough good stuff there to make me excited to play on Friday. Yeah, I, I know, I don't know what it says about the state of Game Freak or the Switch in general, but everybody's saying, like, hey, this is surprisingly good. I mean, tech-wise, it's kind of a disaster. It's like, okay, honestly, it, I, was, I was bracing for impact on the tech aspect, but the fact that people are saying that the design of the world itself and the game is actually compelling and breathes new life into Pokemon, it's like, that's... What I was hoping for. And Janet, I feel like on the podcast, I was trying to downplay your prediction that this game was going to be good and saying, like, it's going to be like a 775. But hey, it's it's beating their predictions. It's doing well. Yeah, I'm I'm really happy about this because I drafted it in kind of funny PS I Love You versus X Cast League. So I just got a bunch of points and I'm making Gary Weta suffer. So I don't know what <laughs> oh, that's because all he counterpicked it. Like that's the right. Way it, the draft works if you've never done it. You have to counterpick someone else's pick, which is you get hurt if that game does well. So yes. you're kind of hoping oh, that nice. one of their picks is bad. Um, so yeah, now as long as a memoir blue, which was my counter pick for him, um, is not like a 10, I'll be okay. And that's the Annapurna thing. So that's, you want to say it's a lock, but you never know. It might be too freaky for Annapurna's own good. You never know with these things. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But uh, I did a Twitter poll because I was just curious about it because there's some debate about whether or not Pokemon Legends Arceus should be considered a mainline Pokemon game. And um, it's like, well, it's from Game Freak. It seems like it should be. It's not a remake. Um, but according to a Twitter poll, a majority of people consider it a spinoff game compared to a mainline Pokemon game, which I think is really interesting. It certainly seems like the way that the Pokemon company and Game Freak are selling this is that it's a mainline game just thrown into the past and changing the format. But Janet, do you have thoughts on this? I'm sure we're going to talk all about it. I feel like it's... um. It is a mainline game that is potentially creating a deviation within the mainline franchise, 
we're kind of like there's Super Mario. What is it? There's got him like y'all know what I'm trying to say. There's like new Super Mario Bros versus right. like mainline Mario, like 3D mm, Mario or whatever. Right. I feel like it's kind of one of those situations. Potentially. I think they're going to maybe see how much you know what the reception is like if they like to do that maybe they'll be like one year on one year off where they're doing like kind of the legend series and then like the more standard gym setup series yeah and kind of swap between those or maybe they'll just have this be like a weird mainline entry that just happened once yeah i imagine it's going to sell well, well based on those reviews so joe merrick on twitter who like runs sarah b oh he yeah he says he had a tweet that said that it is 100% confirmed as a main series because of the, the the title of the game in Japanese is consistent with the mainline series. Okay. All right. Hey, that, that counts for something. Is, yeah, I don't know. If it, yeah. Uh, he seems very confident that it is not a spinoff. I still feel like it's a spinoff, you know, based on the content of the game, which I haven't played yet, admittedly. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, just uh, people were asking. Um, we didn't get early copies of this game, so we're going to be going in fresh with the community, but there's going to be a lot to talk about. I'm excited for more of a systems heavy discussion for the deepest dive and it's like you know pokemon's been around for a long time and the fact that they're shaking it up it's worthy of discussing and really dissecting what they've done what works all that fun stuff so let's celebrate it together as a community and if you're not familiar with the deepest dive it's a standalone video on youtube that'll be up next week uh, and you can also unlock the podcast version if you support us on patreon so we look forward to everybody jumping in and joining us for the deepest dive on pokemon legends arceus uh let's get predicting everybody got their fortune teller hat on Okay. Yes. We clearly don't. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> well, uh, the audio listeners don't know that, though. Yeah, come on, so. Jeff. Oh, we, could have, we, could have, we could be Dang doing it. anything over here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hugo H2P submitted a question over there on Patreon. He said, hey, cohorts, with Uncharted and Mario movies book ending this year, what are your predictions of a new video game-based movie that will be announced throughout 2022? Doesn't have to come out this year, but what will be announced in the video game movie world? Well... Dwayne Johnson yes. is saying that he's making a video game movie, right? And I've seen a lot of God of War predictions out there. But uh, I, I, I my know. reaction is like, this is the guy that did Rampage. I think it's going to be something much less exciting. <laughs> oh, you think it's going to be like Smash TV, some other hot Midway or property? Something. Yeah, I don't know. I, I honestly saw that and I saw everybody speculating a thousand different ways. And it wasn't until like uh, David Jaffe had a new video that's like uh, The Rock as the new Kratos. I, I saw that and I was like... Yeah, I, that's exactly what's going to happen. Can you imagine, like, if you're making a God of War something, who else would you reach out to for your first choice? Like, of course it'd be The Rock. We just need some big, muscly guy who's going to bring yeah. butts into feet. Into, <laughs> butts but, into feet. Kratos is not funny, though. That's kind <laughs> of his whole thing, you know? I'm yeah. just picturing him as, like... Who was he? Maui, right? From Moana. Yeah, what yeah. can I say except you're welcome? Like that's, I just see Kratos singing that song now, and that's a little yeah. bit different. <laughs> a musical of version of God of War, I'd be completely on board for. Mm-hmm. I mean, Kratos. Like he God can, of War by Disney. Oh God, there's still room for like a little personality. I feel like with Kratos, you can still give a little wink and a nod. I mean, look at uh, the rocks out there really hyping up Black Adam. Does that seem like a nonstop laugh riot? Do you think he's gonna have his Jungle Cruise swagger in that one? I don't know anything about Black Adam. He could be a Deadpool for all I know. Like, I really have no clue. <laughs> Number one prediction of the year, Black Adam will suck, and it'll be a real turning point for The Rock of people being like, oh. you know, I think we're about done with this guy. Because, like, that movie is, like, nothing but ego so far. It's like, so far he's talked about how much muscle he's putting on for the role and how Black Adam's going to be stronger than Superman. It's like, eh, I don't care. There's nothing compelling so far about <laughs> everything you've said or shown about Black Adam. <laughs> Uh, okay, so God of War, I think, I think is a good bet. I want. I actually, I wonder if there'll be another Nintendo thing. If they're if they're having a good experience with Mario Brothers, which I bet they are. I bet Miyamoto's enjoying that process. Maybe we see, I don't know, some other property, not Zelda, but some other Nintendo property. Well, they said Mario the, and Sonic at the Olympics. The, the movie. movie. Mm. Honestly, that seems pretty good. Um, yeah. So reportedly, there is a Donkey Kong spinoff in development already. With our dear friend okay, Seth Rogen, yeah. of course. With yeah, Seth yeah. Rogen? Yep, right. yep, yep. Um, Jeff, have you got any hot predictions for a movie? I feel like Horizon. Mm. That's a good one, yeah. Would would be a good one. I think you're Forza right. Forza Horizon. Of course, Forza. we knew exactly with what we were talking cars. about. Yes, so. Forza Horizon 3, of course, to going down under. Um, not, <laughs> not in the movie world, but I am feeling pretty confident that after Elden Ring comes out and destroys humanity based on its critical reception and sales, I think they're going to announce that Elden Ring show. 
Uh, and to be fair, oh sure. To be fair, like they already teased it in some Bandai Namco blog post a while ago, saying like we're looking forward to expanding into areas outside of video games. So I think that's such a slam dunk for just having at the start of a trailer from the world of George R. R. Martin, George R. R. Martin, and the best-selling video game. Like I think they'll lock that down this year somewhere. What about like uh, Infamous? It's you know superhero movie mm-hmm. that like people maybe majority of people might not know it's a video game necessarily but would be like oh a new superhero movie i'll check that out <laughs> yeah could be i'm yeah. trying to think of other sony like uh, naughty dogs all set right they got the last of a show they got uncharted i don't think they're making a jack and daxter movie like probably some other sony property way of the warrior for movie time uh i think um it's also lightly fueled by rumors but i think a dishonored show is going to be announced this mm-hmm. year like the uh co-founder of arcane uh, we did that interview with him, and he seemed pretty confident that it was happening, but that was trying to couch it a lot for like, these are just rumors I hear online. But it's like, man, I think somebody from the studio would send you a text if they were actually talking about making this happen. So <laughs> These are just rumors <laughs> in my email inbox. Yes, exactly, exactly. Not that he'd be involved anyway. But yeah. um, Okay, so here's the thing. Janet, um, last year we had Serial Vasquez on this podcast making predictions, and Serial... Serial came out swinging. Serial predicted last year that Microsoft would consolidate Game Pass and Ultimate, which, not quite. Uh, he predicted that there would be a new game announced from the Link's Awakening team. Nah, not quite. Uh, he predicted a new faux retro console that reads all kinds of discs, which is interesting. Um, but that, that also didn't happen. But So Serial just failed so miserably that we didn't invite him back. And uh, gotta, you're going to have to kind of fill that out. gap. Yeah, I hope that's okay with you, Janet. Um, yeah, it's like getting relegated in soccer. I understand. Yes, it's exactly. <laughs> we all know what that means now because of Ted Lasso. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Kyle, you actually know that from Ted Lasso. I only know it from Ted Lasso. Oh yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. I have no idea what else it means. Um, so we all made big predictions last year, and it was fun to go back and listen to that. I encourage everybody to go back and listen to that because we're all very confident in uh, what's well, going to be Except for happening. us, you told us not to. You we were like, "Don't <laughs> listen." I know because I wanted it to be a surprise for you, uh, Kyle. You predicted that Breath of the Wild two would not be out, but one for one. But that Wind Waker HD and Twilight Princess were released on Switch, and you'd get a oh. bonus for getting both of them. And then I looked in the camera and said, sincerely, I would bet $1,000 that Wind Waker will release on Switch in 2021. So I guess I owe <laughs> so the who, money to who somebody. Gives you that, who do you give that money to? Uh, to, to the community, I guess, to have at it. Um, <laughs> you predicted there'd be a big budget Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, Kyle. Yeah. Which did not happen. This one, a little bit of an asterisk. You predicted that people will come around on Cyberpunk 2077 with the release. The re-release or on new gen consoles, like the, yeah. Which I guess t- TBD. Yeah, I don't think that prediction came true. Yeah, you also announced this one, which is interesting. You said Konami will announce a remake of the original Silent Hill, but not do it in a big way and just do it through a cryptic tweet, and the original creator will be involved. Which is interesting because the original creator is making a Silent Hill inspired game with. Splitter face or whatever the hell that thing is called. Yeah, Slitter head. Slitter head. Something like that. We all remember it. Um, but I feel like Konami did have some cryptic tweet along the way about something about Silent Hill, right? Just not a remake of the first. So you were kind of in the wheelhouse. I definitely remember that happening. All right, we all remember. <laughs> um, and then, of course, uh, Kyle had this prediction, which last year we played clips from the previous year. In our predictions, everyone was confused, but like, who's talking right now? Is this a new clip or the past? Is there any time there's a piano playing on this podcast? Um, that's a clip from the past. So this is us from a year ago talking, Kyle. Um, this is one of your predictions for the year. We will see a teaser this year for the animated Super Mario Brothers movie from Illumination. Oh, the, of course. And the big, like, the big internet sort of embracing twist is that Charles Martinet will not be the voice of Mario. Yeah. It's going to be Chris Pratt. Uh, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Did you? So that's you didn't you didn't mess with that. I you did said not Chris edit Pratt? that. I did not edit that. That was. I a guess genuine Cereal, prediction. Cereal said Chris Pratt at one point too, didn't he? Totally. So back there's an episode of the Game Informer Show podcast from like 2018 or 2019 when they announced the movie and Serial offhand made a joke that Chris Pratt was going to be Mario. But let the record show that like no one even reacted. Like I don't even know if I heard Serial say that, but you can see it in the tape. So it's funny that yeah, yeah. maybe I was channeling Serial again with this, but uproarious laughter at the concept. So thank yeah. you. Thank that you. A pretty good prediction, I think. I think I'm kind of close there. Right? I think we should hold our head up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the rest yeah. of mine are, are not so good. I announced that, er, announced, I predicted that uh, God of War Ragnarok was going to be cross-gen, which was kind of a layup, uh, you know. I, I guess that The Last of Us Part Two 
PS5 version would release along with the multiplayer factions thing. That was wrong. Mm. I predicted Nintendo will release a Wii Classic. That was stupid. I predicted that Call of Duty will rip off Escape from Tarkov, which they didn't, but Ubisoft did with that Ghost Recon game, which they then canceled immediately, or at least put in dormant stasis. I predicted that Ubisoft would shut down Hyperscape, which somehow they have not. I predicted that Rare's Everwild <laughs> won't be out, but it'll be among our most anticipated games, which that seemed to get a big reboot this year, so not, not quite. I predicted the teaser for the next Bioshock. Uh, I predicted that two-player productions documentary on Psychonauts 2, the development of that, would win our greatest work of art of all time. Um, but uh, <laughs> that did not release. Hopefully it releases soon. I can't wait to see that, where we can lock it in as the greatest work of art of all time. Um, Jeffum. Here we go. Big Jeffum here. Right. The prognosticator of prognosticators. He says, PlayStation Plus will become PS Pass, folding PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now together. No, but they're working a little too early. Ahead of your time. That's right. Also ahead of your time, you announced that uh, Nintendo Switch 4K uh, would be announced. Uh, You predicted, this is a little squirrely, you predicted that a multiplayer game will eclipse Fortnite. Ooh. Which it's like, well, squirrely and yet still didn't happen. Well, I mean, Roblox has more players, but probably even when you made that prediction, Roblox had more players. Yeah, Yeah, that doesn't... uh, It's very kind of you to try and bail me out. I'm trying to do what I can. Uh, You went out on a limb. You walked the gangplank for this one. You predicted that Skull and Bones would not release in 2021. <laughs> Woo! Uh, let's see. You predicted that Monolith won't sue anyone for stealing the Nemesis system. That's confusing. You predicted that a game that uses AI chatbot will be produced uh, using procedural narrative as well, which uh, the chatbot thing, uh, not quite. This one is good, Jeff. Um, you predicted the Mass Effect trilogy will be a, quote, flat eight. <laughs> where it's like, that's a tough one, but I wonder how it reviewed. Looked it up, I consider this a Hall of Famer because both IGN and GameSpot gave it exactly an 8. So I think that's there pretty solid. Um, and then you had this one way back then, Jeff. Um, let's listen to your big prediction. You were right about the Bethesda thing last year, and I was wrong about the Hello Games thing. But I'm going to go bold again, and I'm going to say Microsoft is going to purchase EA. Oh, I love that. And I'm, and I'm feeling that. it because because they have roped in that EA Play into their whole ultimate, you know, Game Pass ultimate ecosystem. Mm-hmm. They got like one foot in there already. We're bringing you all these EA games already. Why don't you just, you know, get the whole thing under that wing? I love that. Join us. I think that's super doable. I think they're going to become the Borg and just keep on (laughs) getting in as many people so that they don't have, because that way too, also they don't have other competing Game Pass services out there. You were so close. Makes sense, but... You were probably flipping a coin between EA and Activision, but Jeff, you were so close, so close to being a genius. I'm sorry. EA would be insane with... With FIFA, like you get FIFA, man. Yeah, but Call of Duty's oh, bigger than FIFA, right? Worldwide has to yeah. be. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah. Like, like usually when you see the, the big sales, it's higher. So yeah, yeah. Hanson, Hanson, I really wish I hadn't listened to you and did listen to those predictions, um, because we're gonna we're gonna hear some rehashes <laughs> on this year's predictions. All right, kick it off, dude. Uh, rehash that turd. We're starting. Hell yeah. Uh. All right, well, my first prediction, bold um, out of nowhere, (laughs) Microsoft is going to add Ubisoft Plus to Game Pass or just buy Ubisoft. Buy Ubisoft, okay. (sighs) The odds of Microsoft... Well, I'm sorry, there are no odds. This is going to happen. This is a prediction from Jeffum, so it's it's as good as gold. Um, Boy, that seems doable, but boy, I mean, that anything be... seems doable at this point after right. 70 billion for Activision. And it's so tough. I ran into that problem, too, of trying to make these predictions. Like, we're still reeling from Microsoft buying Activision. So it's so tough not just to make all predictions like Microsoft will buy this, Microsoft will buy this, uh, Tencent will buy this. But, you know, I, I, that's solid. I like it. Uh, Janet, you got I, one? I feel like I feel like at least the adding adding the Game Pass to the Game Pass thing, mm-hmm. in part because I thought they had already done it. Um and and now they have Rainbow Six Extraction Ooh, Day okay. One and, and everything. So yeah, I feel like that's at least that one's gonna gonna happen. But all right, all right. at this point, they must just be looking at it and be like, well, you know, we got Activision, we got Call of Duty already. Why not just buy another fifty studios? Take it all, Janet. What do you got? 
Big prediction. Yeah, I'm I'm literally out here like other tabbing out like how much to buy Ubisoft, <laughs> and it comes back with like, do you mean Ubisoft Plus? Because you can go to the website. I'm like, no, I want to buy Ubisoft. That's also I'm sure Phil Spencer's doing the same thing exactly. right now. Like, come on, right? Google. Like, if you Just could give look, me a number. If we could see professionally the search history, right? Like, game, how much did Game Pass have at launch? You know, somebody's just googling that. Anyway, um, I for my first one. Yeah, make it. A I'm good gonna one. go kind of basic. It could really go either way here. Very 50 50. God of War gets delayed. PlayStation yeah. says like, look forward to these games in 2022, and God of War is listed on there. I'm gonna go with that being delayed. I think that's. I think that's the safe equivalent not calling you a coward janet but i think that's a safe equivalent of like calling it cross Gen. i think you're totally right i think i think call it, or i think god of wars is totally getting delayed from this year um feeling more and more confident about that um okay here's one <clears throat> look i'm starting bold i'm not i'm not tiptoeing around this stuff in 2022 ea will make their big quote unquote metaverse play to please shareholders and they will do it with a new game that's just called Sim, where they lean into the whole metaverse social arena. It's also the sequel to The Sims, but has elements of Sim City where you're working in your own house. You can build up the community, attach different houses together to slowly build up the community that is your overall city. City designing aspects, The Sims designing aspects, it's going to be their platform to keep rolling along. Who knows if it'll work, but I think when the entire world is talking about there's money in that metaverse, you know, it's a little bit like a metaverse is that Sims. So they'll lean into that for this new game and it's going to be called Sim. <clears throat> Thank you. That's pretty please. good. Please, please down in front, everybody, please, everybody relax. I can't stand the standing ovation. That uh, is bold. That's very, you get very specific. With why you. not? It it is more, very specific. It's more fun if you're specific, right? It is. And yeah. then Ben's like, I'm announcing that I'm leaving Min Max to join EA <laughs> and, they're in, and Spearhead, their Sim project. I'm coming, Daddy McNamara. Hey, uh, Kyle, what do you got? <laughs> Uh, okay, here's one. Um, I think Nintendo will release some kind of hardware, not not a Switch upgrade, not like Switch 4K, not like a new Switch, but like something new and something unexpected that will be like a physical thing that we have to buy that's like kind of closer to the Game & Watches that they've been making, okay. but something something unique, you know, not, not a new Game & Watch, because uh, they did Mario and Zelda. I don't know who they would, Metroid, I guess they could do or something. But um, yeah, there's su- some kind of physical... Uh, machine that and Nintendo you will be would Mario Kart Live count as that for you like you know just trying to think mm. of something they've done before no I, I'm thinking more of like a playable something you know like I don't not I don't want to get as specific as Hanson and say like you know Coward. a Game Boy you know with a bunch of Game Boys name it Kyle name it yeah come on no, anybody can I be can't. vague what I can't. but that's the thing about it is like I think it's just going to be knowing Nintendo it's just going to be something that's totally left field like the predictable thing is okay. a Game Boy Advance that has a bunch of pre- games preloaded on there All right. but I just All right. I just see something that I'm just going to like raise my eyebrow and be like whoa weird okay. I'm, okay. Gi- I'm giving you 30% coward on that one Kyle for that prediction okay yeah I can't I can't I, I'm not as creative as the people at Nintendo. I can't come up with what it is. I just know it's going to surprise me. I see no evidence of that. Uh, Jeff, what do you got? <laughs> uh, well, this one kind of ties into your previous one, Hanson. Yeah. Um, we're going to spend all of 2022 hearing about the metaverse without anyone taking a single meaningful step towards creating it. <laughs> right. That's a really good and one. I think. I think Facebook will do some kind of lame like VR crap that there no one's going to actually care about. Yep. Yeah, they'll do it again. They'll <laughs> name it 2.0 or whatever. But otherwise, it's just going to be a lot of talk about metaverse and no one's actually going to sit down and say, hey, what would this actually look like for a yeah. video game or any other kind of larger platform? Right. What are you? Because it doesn't make any sense. It's nothing. What are you actually talking about? And it's crazy because like, you know, I saw Bobby Kotick is on some news show and of course the anchor's just like tell me about this metaverse i don't understand anything about gaming maybe you can explain it and then he just rambled on for nonsense but then there's another interview where he talked about like yeah phil spencer and i talked about the metaverse and we both know it doesn't mean anything but then he goes on it's like well tell that to your shareholders man jesus uh okay here's a here's a prediction um <clears throat> i predict this is my most cowardly perhaps it's, it's, it's my most ambiguous, but please stay, stay, stay with me. I predict there will be a game that is a big brand crossover, but not like a Smash Brothers style thing. I'm talking like General Mills. I'm talking 
a, a McDonald's versus Burger King versus Wendy's video game. I think brands are going to lean in and try and collect on that idea of like, isn't it crazy that we're working together? So rival companies outside of video games having a game themed about it is my prediction. In the multiverse. In the multiverse. You got to go there. I like it. Okay. You got one? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback off that one. And one oh. that I wrote down is that uh, the next like weird thing that Fortnite is going to cross over with, mm-hmm. television sitcoms. Ooh. Like we're going to see like, you know, I don't know what a new one. Abbott Elementary is a very popular sitcom right now. You know, Seinfeld, something like that. Like television Ooh. sitcoms are going to make their way into Fortnite. <laughs> I would, the thing about sitcoms is they're famous for having very few guns in them. I mean, Naruto is a playable character in, in uh, Fortnite. I don't think he does a lot of shooting. Is Rio and Chun Li, like, this is game on. All right, I like that. They gave Ariana Grande a gun. You can give anyone. <laughs> there you go. It's true. They gave Kratos a gun, for Christ's sake. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Janet. But I just, mostly oh. I'm just thinking of like, I was like, what else can they do? do really they do every popular movie they've done all the marvel stuff all the dc stuff they've done like warner brothers stuff like they've done everything it's like what else is there left for them to pull in and i was like i don't see a lot of television characters you know i mean (laughs) running around in fortnite this is play a seinfeld with the pirate shirt in fortnite i think i can see that happening i would i would bet money that we'll see the jurassic park uh, big integration for Fortnite this but see, year. But even with the new even one. that feels like too much of a of a give of a gimme. Yeah, like that. Yeah. that doesn't even feel like a prediction. Yep, I think you're right. Uh, all right, Janet, just give us a haymaker. Okay, um, I'm gonna go with and more NFT stuff. And if we want to be specific, NFTs in Fortnite. NFTs in Fortnite. Mm-hmm. They have they've done they have not done that yet. They've done it, and they do plenty of. I feel like too. We've seen Fortnite do things that make people mad, and they're like. That's rough to hear. And they just keep on trucking. Like the Among Us stuff, you know, that drama that right. happened last year. And they did eventually like reach out to the team, but I don't think they care that deep about that kind of stuff. Like I, I think they'd be down to do it. I think if any game's gonna be able to pull it off and get away with it, it'd be Fortnite. That's interesting. God. Oof, the internet would have some opinions on that one, but that's good. That's good. <laughs> Jeffum, this is it, dude. Uh well this ties back to all the Fortnite stuff. Um <laughs> And that is Fortnite is going to double down on its party royale mode and mm-hmm. just come up with some other new kind of mode that's like a nonviolent, just screwing around with friends. I think they're going to expand that, just like continue blowing that out for people who don't want to run around as Seinfeld with a gun and they just want to be pirate Seinfeld. Mm. Yeah, I mean, what can they do other than the party mode? I mean, it's already in there. That's that's not my problem to figure out. <laughs> okay. So, the first right. one out. All right, yeah. that's fine. Um, here we go. Here's something that's happening in 2022. Star Wars will announce a fighting game, and it is a platform fighter. And in the trailer or in the title, it will have a slight nod to Masters of Tarascasi, the PlayStation 1 classic Star Wars fighting game. Wow. Like a character? A it, character from yeah, Tarascasi? Yeah, character or the name is called Masters of just something. Remember when they referenced mm. that game and that solo film? Oh yeah, yeah. It's they really said weird. Tar- Amelia- like it's like a canonical style of combat. Yeah, right? yeah. Like Amelia oh, Clark's yeah. character mentioned it. Um, and then I was thinking, like, what? Star Wars seems obsessed with focusing on like prestige studios for their games. I was trying to think, like, who is the most prestigious studio that can make a fighting game? Uh, NetherRealm's probably busy, but like maybe like a. Arc system works, or even they go to like Bandai Namco and get the Smash Ultimate team to say, "F it, here's a lot of money. Will you make a Star Wars platform fighter?" I could see it. Um, Apple does like announces or like their VR AR headset. They get into that space this mm, year. Yeah, there we go. It's already been it's already been rumored. Um, I did some quick googling and like from Tom's guide, they cited a report done in January 2021 from Bloomberg's Mark Gurman talking about Apple's potential like VR or mixed reality thing. Um, and Apple, you know, gets in on everything and they have like a great ecosystem. Like I, for one, have like almost nothing but Apple products at this yeah. point. So I think that's clearly, I-, I would be surprised if they didn't end up doing that at least at some point. And my guess is that it's going to be this year. Yeah. And there are rumors that it's going to cost an absurd amount. We're talking like north of valve index levels, but it's like, well, they're just kind of 
priming the pump, just starting to inch in that direction so they can eventually work down the price. So yeah, I, th- I think like that's Apple a good Apple Arcade one. with the glass, like that'd be dope. Oh, just kind think of. of it. Just think of going to the actual <laughs> <Kind> arcade. <of. laughs> All right, Kyle, what do you got? Um, Earthbound will come to Switch. Okay. Mother 3 will continue to not exist, but Earthbound will be on, you know, the Super Nintendo collection this yeah. year. Yeah, mm. Okay. That's like 90% cowardice, Jeff. Um, are you with me on that? You kidding me with this guy? I have no idea we have the, we'd get these coward ratings. Like, this is, this is not, I was not briefed on this. You're right, you're right. I won't become the YouTube comments before the YouTube comments. Uh, all right, Jeff. Um, here we go. No cowardice here. Um, <laughs> this one was also one of mine from last year, so <laughs> take that for whatever. Uh, Sony is going to launch Project Spartacus. Yep. It's not going to be as good as Game Pass. Okay. There's oh, okay. A, there's oh, that's a, so no, bold there's take, a, dude. There's a zero percent chance that they will rope in day one launches for. for I their big I games. take back my like don't troll us for our predictions comment because that is so <laughs> like I I had a similar one like just to jump in really quick where yeah. mine's just like Spartacus is good which is kind of weak and vague but I just feel like it'll be generally critically well received like I'm sure there'll be things that are desired but I think. The general reception will be good. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely with Jeff. There's not... I would be shocked <laughs> to see a world where any first-party game is there. Yeah. Well, Band-Aid. I yeah. think the most we'll get is like, you know, how we had Bug Snacks on PS Plus immediately. Like, that would be well, on PS Plus Plus Plus. Well, what is... I mean, what is the thing now... I thought all, but there are a bunch of first-party games on there now, right? Like, if mm-hmm. you pay for PlayStation Plus, you can get God of War and like... The PS Plus collection, yeah. PS Plus... I mean... Is it just get roped into that? I don't know. That that feels like a, a half step to Game Pass as it is. Just like a bunch of really good. Sony but it's such games. a huge difference of games from three to four years ago and more versus True. day one. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's Rock, gigantic. Yeah. yeah. That Especially one's a weird with, yeah. one too because it it's only for PS5 users. So I'll, yeah. I'll be curious to see how they are consolidating some of what they have because the PS Plus collection is really cool. I'm I'm glad they have it for people that like you have a PS5 and you miss some or all of the PS4 hits. But I don't know what they do with that in the world of like PS Plus Plus, which is probably just going to be called PlayStation Plus, and they're just going to loop in stuff. But I like to call it PlayStation Plus Plus because it, it sounds it dumber. It is good. It is good. Um, let's see. On the Sony front, I will make a prediction that Shuhei Yoshida, Shuhei Yoshida, will leave Sony. That'll be my what? prediction. Why would you say that? I look. I don't want it to happen. But he's been there a long time. You know, he's mainly focusing on indie games at this point. Seems less and less of a priority for Sony. I'm sure people are courting from him for his experience left and right. And I think maybe it'd be time for him to just uh, pack it up, head on out. I don't want it to happen, Janet. But that's just... But you just made it happen. Oh, crap. Yeah. No! Yeah, he did. Shoe, hey, he forgive us. It. Forgive us. It's fine. He'll be at some college, like, talking about something. It'll be, it'll be okay. Yeah, it'll be all right. Uh, oh, that'd be awesome. If he just went and taught at a college, we're going to take his class. Or he could finally focus on writing a book. That'd be fantastic. Uh, okay, Janet, what do you got? Um, the Steam Deck is going to be a hit, but then it's going to be like impossible to get after that. Yep, I think that's solid. And they said it's coming out, what, February 28th now? Yeah. This announced today. Um, Allegedly. I, I think that is going to be, like, you know, I just listened to the 8.4 Play podcast and Mark McDonald on there has one in the office because he's working on games with enhanced games. Um, and he was like gaga over it. He's like, I didn't care about this thing at all, but getting into my hands, actually playing it, it's like big and chunky, but it is so cool. It is, it is the I mean, super switch that we want. It is like far and away going to be Steam's most successful hardware thing. Oh like, yeah. Really, like, yeah. Easily. Uh, all right, Kyle. Um, Shenmue 4 will be teased. Wow. You're just, <laughs> you're out of your <laughs> mind. <laughs> like based on the success of that anime, that's what I'm going off of. Yeah, the okay. Anime that's aired a single. I think I don't even know if it's aired a single episode. Yes, I just saw the trailer recently. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, this is happening. Uh, Jeff, you got more? <laughs> got one more. Hell yeah! It's from my list last time. Hell yeah! It, it's that uh, I'm doubling down, and and honestly, when I wrote this one this time, I needed a fifth one. I was like. This is not happening this year, but I'm. It's 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 probably still a couple of years out. But apparently, I put it on last year anyway. So um, I I still feel like we're going to have artificially in, t- in like AI created content. <laughs> what is this? Either in terms of art that has been generated and added into a game, or like text dialogue. 
in a game. This okay. Year. AI beyond like a we did we played AI Dungeon last year. Um, that is but true. That was more of like a goofy tool kind of thing, right. like a proof of concept more. But I feel like probably not this year, but maybe next year. Like I I feel like we're very close to that actually spilling over into actual game design. So you'll you'll have like a deck builder, but like the cards will have been AI generated art or like the enemies or things like that. Okay. All right. Uh let's see. Is this one too boring? Um Jackbox games will be purchased by Embracer Group. Will be my prediction. They've been going mm. strong and independent down there for so long in Chicago, but they just released Jackbox Party Pack 8. Like, seems like it's a good time to scoop up that talent for a bit of a price and try and point them in some new direction. There's something there people can do with phones and, and that much know-how, that much comedy writing chops. Yeah, and yeah. Embracer just bought Asmodee. Oh, that's like right. The, the big um, board game space. And right. Board, you know, like, board game publisher. And so I could see that being the most adjacent if they wanted to, like try and merge those two worlds. Yeah, it's interesting. There we go. Okay, thank you for backing it up and telling us that for sure it's going to happen. Kyle, you got uh, any more? I wrote, I did write down <gasps> again this year without remembering that I had said it last year. But guys, this is the year. Cyberpunk is going to come back in a big way. A bunch of people are going to play it. They're going to be like, oh my God, this is a masterpiece, especially now that it works. It's it's time to shine. It's coming. Okay. All right. I think it's safe. Uh, I got some lingering ones. Look, I'll just volume out there, and then next year I'll pull out the clip and say, this was my first prediction. I said it was absolutely going to happen. Uh, they're not ready to show off too much for the new Indiana Jones game, but they're going to want to build hype in some way. I think they'll announce a remaster for Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Kind of do for that what they did for Day of the Tentacle and all that stuff. Probably not oh, Double okay. Fine doing it, because I don't know if anybody at Double Fine had a connection to Indiana Jones. I'm sure Tim Schafer's in the credits, but outside of that, I guess Peter McConnell did the music. But well, the he's always is, credited. He has a weird credit in a lot of those games, Tim Schafer. Right. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, well, it was like with um, Star Wars with Shadows of the Empire. Didn't it say in the credits, like, Tim Schafer in no way tried to impede the development of this game or something? Yeah, Tim. Tim the Raccoon King Schaefer never actively tried to sabotage the development of Star Wars <laughs> Shadows of the Empire is his name. That's how he is credited in that game. That's so good. That's so which good. Which is amazing. Uh, other predictions, I think, um, we've talked about this before in a standalone video on our YouTube channel. I think Amy Hennig uh, is making a Fantastic Four game for Marvel. I think that's going to be announced. Uh, let's see. I think there'll still be shortage uh, uh, supply shortages at the end of the year, but that's, you know... That's maybe too obvious. I think that Ragnarok, Starfield, and Zelda all will not release in 2021. This is this is where my thinking safe is bets. going. Safe, safe bets. bets. Safe bets. Um, Any Zelda this year, we think? I don't know, man. I don't, I don't think so. Probably not. At this point, if I, I don't, I don't, I like, I don't think Breath of the Wild 2. I also don't think Wind Waker or Twilight Princess or any kind of. I now wonder will we ever see Wind Waker? It's definitely it's getting into like the Pikmin 4 energy, right? But kind of worse <laughs> because we at least that we were told was done. I mean, I've played it. It exists. <laughs> just needs to copy paste uh, from one to the Wii U file to the Switch file. It's very easy, I assume. Is that too much to ask? Um, yeah. Hideo Kojima will announce his next game, and of course, we all know it's going to be about um, Postmates in Space. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I actually I wrote that down t too. Doing but your taxes. I was your taxes. Because <laughs> a tax game. <laughs> yeah. Because he, I mean, they just did director's cut like a few months ago. So right. I feel like he's still in Death Stranding mode. And it, But he did say that his seek, whatever he's working on next, he wants to take like a positive edge right. to like a more optimistic angle. Oh, like, right. He, and he said There goes yeah. my other idea of it's it takes place in purgatory. That's probably Ooh. not going to be. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's not terrible. That's about as positive as he can get, maybe. I think he said even like on the Game Awards, like, I'll see you next year, Mr. Keeley. So I think it's a good bet that's going to be announced. I'm going to go with it's something focusing on animals. And the Animal Kingdom. That'll be my okay. prediction for Kojima. He'll make Tokyo Jungle, and then someone will Kojima's be like, we'll show the Animal teaser. Crossing. Oh, exactly. <laughs> they'll show the teaser, and they'll be like, uh, Mr. Kojima, this game uh, has already been made. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tokyo Jungle exists. I can't believe you even called it the same thing. You didn't want to Google that. <laughs> oh, crap. We've been working on it for months. Um, okay, what about these predictions? Uh, give me your prediction over under. Do you think this game's going to overperform where we think it's going to be at critically, commercially, bundle it all together, or underperform? Um, or equal perform. Or equal perform. Uh, Janet, Horizon Forbidden West, overperform or underperform? Uh, over. I think I'm going under. I think it's going to be super solid, but 
not as interesting as the first one overall. That's that's going to be my bold take on that. Uh, Kyle Saints Row. Oh wow! I feel I think over Same because here. I think expectations are low. Same here, absolutely. Uh, Jeff Lum, Starfield. <laughs> right. This one's really based on nothing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> vibes. Um, I'm gonna say under. Under. I, mm. I, I think the um, I I don't trust that Bethesda has has advanced their engine as much as people are going to hope. Like, totally. I think you're still going to get locked into a conversation and be like, God, you're still zooming in on that per dumb person's face. Yeah, there's going to be, definitely that's going to be the big critique. It's like, this is still a Bethesda game and now that's seen as so antiquated and it's not as much of a revolution as people expect if it releases this year. Um, okay, Kyle, Stranger of, Paradise, fi- <laughs> Stranger of Paradise, Final Fantasy Origin. I mean, if the reaction of the trailer is any indication, over. Because people just see it as like a weird novelty thing. Yeah, I think even if it's I, I I think about this a lot. Leo once said, "If you just put at the end credits of your game, this was supposed to be stupid. <laughs> like, you're scot free. Like it, 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 you're whatever. You know, like right. doesn't matter if you really had a serious intent. And I feel like that's kind of where that game is going to land. Yes, where everyone's going to be like, oh, it's so dumb. I love it. And yep. then like yep. Square Enix is going to be like, oh, it's it's dumb. Oh." Uh, 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 great i'm glad you guys like it because it's it's dumb and then just turn away from the camera and let a, a single tear roll down the <laughs> numeros are our greatest comedic talent um <laughs> janet elden ring ah uh, i guess i'll mm, i guess over i feel like yeah. equal is just so such a cop-out answer but it probably it would is. be more equal than over everyone thinks that game is going to be amazing and it probably is so <sighs> yeah i think it's going to be over i think it's going to be game of the year 2022 i bet it's not even going to be close for the discussion um and honestly this is probably putting too much faith into uh dan tack back at game informer but hit the way he talked about this game on the game Informer show podcast recently was so glowing it was scary like dan's like you don't understand this is one of the greatest games of all time like based on everything that i've played so far this is such a slam dunk for their greatest game it's better than bloodborne blah blah, blah. i think people are going to be gaga over this thing um it's also the new game Informer cover congrats to them um, okay, Jeff, I'm the one we've been dying to ask you about. Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. Movie's coming out in December. This game probably has to come out in December. Where's it landing, dude? Uh, still under. <laughs> still under after all this. Okay. Under the under the bedrock expectations that people will have for Jesus. it. Jesus. All right. Wow. I mean, it's a solid studio. People like the Division games enough, right? It's, Who's making it's it? funny because my, my reaction was going to be would have been over because mm. I think people just think Avatar is really stupid. Right. But like they haven't revisited in years. I think if they went and watched the movie, they'd be like, oh, this is kind of cool. I rem- this is better than I remembered. Yep. Great. I hope I'm wrong. Hey, we all hope you're <laughs> wrong. Uh, Kyle, Hogwarts Legacy, over or under? Uh, well, under, I think. Yeah. Because of, you know. The J.K. Rowling connection. People just be so bogged down with that. And everything like that. Yeah. Could be. All right. Um, also... Uh, just going through the list of predictions and stuff. We have a recurring segment now because we did it last year as well. This is a segment I like to call Studios Ready to Pop. Uh, These are the studios that I feel like are overdue for an announcement. Uh, Let me know if you can think of any other ones in the chat or YouTube comments, all that fun stuff. Netherrealm, certainly getting up there. Uh, A lot of rumors that they're just working on a new Mortal Kombat game, which is shocking. Like when I visited that studio for Mortal Kombat 11, I remember I asked Ed Boon in like a rapid fire, I said, scale of one to 10, how much do you in the studio want to make a new IP? And he said, 9.6. <laughs> so like, it was such a bummer to hear that the rumors like, yeah, they're just making another Mortal Kombat game after all. When did that big DLC add-on come out? Was that 2019? I think that, that was 2019. Added, like, a ton of content? Yep, Aftermath. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty sure that's 2019. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah they're, I think they're ready to go. Um, Monolith, a lot of people seem to be Pointing, suggesting that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is on the horizon, so that's probably getting announced this year or some other game in the Xenoblade series. I mean, you know, aren't they're probably pretty head down on Breath of the Wild 2. That's like, interesting. Resistance to that, right? I think so, but there's so many rumors about that Xenoblade thing that it seems like something's happening. Uh, the Coalition, Gears, like, that seems like it should be announced this year, right? 2019, Gears 4? Oh, I think earlier than that. Gears 5 was, was release five? date? Yeah, that was, that was 5, all right. It was okay. 2019. It was yeah, probably right. like 2019, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Um, 
I could see them taking like a Halo Infinite style approach, trying to do kind of like a bigger, softer reboot, making it more of a platform as well. Seems like Halo Infinite's working out okay for them so far. Um, Compulsion Games, the developers of We Happy Few, uh, Microsoft Studio Now, I feel like they are more than due. Uh, level 5, the Nino Kuni team. I feel like we're, we're due for something new there. They have uh, Inazuma 11 coming out, I believe, still, but it seems like there's still a lot of RPG talent and they haven't announced anything big there for a while. Well, what about, isn't Yokai Watch? Isn't there a new Switch one coming? Is there? Is that level five? Yeah, it would be, but I don't know. Uh, let's see, the teams, oh, uh, House House, who made Untitled Goose Game, if you like they're due for a new announcement. Uh, Simogo, who made Sayonara, Sayonara Wild Hearts, I think they're due. Mm. David O'Reilly, who made Everything years ago, if you recall. Uh, that game, Everything, that was funky. I feel like that's that's due. Um, Subset Games, who made Into the Breach. I feel like they're due. Giant Sparrow, who made What Remains of Edith Finch. I feel like they're due. Uh, Ghost Town Games, who made Overcooked 1 and 2. I feel like, hey, ring the dinner bell. We're ready for something new, everybody. Um, and then Gen Design is a weird one with Ueda from uh-huh. Shadow the Colossus fame. They said at a post recently where they said they'd, quote, do their best to make some announcements this year. So... Who knows? Did you, you saw that teaser image on their website in like 2016 or 17. It's pretty old now. I don't even know if it's still there. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's like a big monster looking guy. It showed like a woman sitting on a, like a, like a, uh, a tablet kind of Shadow of the Colossus style and like a giant hand kind of like reaching. Yeah. Her, and that's like, that's all we've got. And it was Epic that's partnered with him as well, right? So I'm yep. curious to see what that actually looks like. Um, all right. Hey, Jeff, do you know how this whole thing operates? on premonitions strictly on premonitions which you can find over at patreon.com slash minmax with two wins in honor of minnesota everybody um so head on over there if you like the show you can help support the show and you can help support it just like some of these big supporters here including let me get these up and running uh fantasy flight games they want everybody to know about the lord of the rings card game the revised core set uh it's been popular for over 10 years now it is a co-op game and it's not like a uh what do you call it, Jeff? I'm a trading card game? A collectible card game. It's not one of those. This is like a right. one to four player co-op experience. You're journeying through Middle Earth, fighting the minions of Mordor, all that fun stuff. Uh, the box has enough cards and components for one to four players. There's campaign cards, boons, and there's burdens that are new, and you can help bring in the new show, the big new Lord of the Rings show on Amazon by living in the world. Also, here's a big thing. We're doing a giveaway for the Lord of the Rings card game set. Uh, and you can follow MinMax Show on Twitter. We're giving away three copies of it. North America only. Sorry, everybody. Uh, but check out MinMax Show on Twitter. Give us a follow and you will see the competition there and figure out how to win. Um, also, thank you to our dear friends at Diverge Coffee. They want everybody to know. They say, hey, all Brian and Nick here from Diverge Coffee. We just wanted to thank you again for all your support. We hope all you wonderful MinMaxers have enjoyed the coffee you've gotten from us. If you haven't yet, check us out at DivergeCoffee.com. That's DivergeCoffee.com. Com and use code MINMAX for 15% off of any order. Again, that's DivergeCoffee.com, discount code MINMAX. Two wins, everybody. Check out Diverge. Uh, next time you think of coffee, think of these fine folks. Uh, they got their start in the Better Quest channel in the Discord, so... Hometown That's lads. Awesome. Um, also, thank you to our friends at Fixture Gaming. They want everybody to know about the Fixture S1. It is a $35 attachment that you have for your Nintendo Switch Pro controller so that you can slide the screen onto it and play with the best controller on the go. There's a link below if you want to check it out. It's over on Amazon for $35. They have been getting a lot of questions about uh, the Nintendo Switch OLED and if they're going to make a new version that is compatible with that. They are working on that. The date is to be announced, but there is an OLED version of the Fixture S1 on the way. So look forward to that, everybody. Again, there's a link below for all this stuff if you want to check it out. Also, thank you to our friends at at uh, I am 8-Bit. They want everybody to know that if you go to their online store, you can get the Persona 25th Anniversary Deluxe Vinyl Box Set. It's a vinyl collection of music from every Persona game. Now, is that something or is that something, Kyle? That's very cool. It is very cool. Uh, music is important to that game. I don't know if you're aware of it. That is very true. So you can check that out. It has music from games one through five. You can also get all of the soundtracks individually, and it comes with the uh, digital version of the soundtrack as well. And if you go to their online store, their wonderful on- online store for iMateBit, you can use the promo code New Year New Code. 
new year, new code for 10% off everything in that store as long as it's under or 10% off everything in that store as long as it's under $100. Um, and because they are so generous, they are shipping out a prize to somebody from the Minimax community, somebody that submitted a question or comment over on Patreon, and they're shipping out a Disco Elysium soundtrack on CD. So whoever wins Question of the Week here is winning the Disco Elysium soundtrack on CD thanks to I Am 8-Bit. Um, and you can win a prize each and every week as well if you support us at any tier on Patreon, then head over and submit a comment or a question for us to read on the show. Jeff, are you ready to get started with these, man? Absolutely. Great. Well, buckle up. Here we go. Jarrell Pryor writes in and says, Hey, everybody. The Microsoft Activision purchase is still stuck in my head, but I feel like in 18 months it's going to feel like old news. But I'm not sure that's the case for the wider, less industry-focused audience of gaming. In terms of recognition from the wider public, when do you think it'll be common knowledge that Microsoft will own Call of Duty? Does everyone already know? Is it only going to happen when the next Call of Duty comes out? Honestly, did the wider public ever know who Activision is? I, I don't think so. Maybe... I mean, we actually did a whole video about that back at Game Informer, which was, it was a man on the street bit where we asked people if they knew who made Call of Duty. And the answer was no. People guessed like Valve. Like it was, it was bizarre. It was just all over the place. Huh. Um, so yeah, when will the common knowledge be accepted that Microsoft owns Call of Duty, do you think? See, I, I was actually thinking kind of quickly. Yeah? Like more, like quicker than, because, I, but I'm kind of going off my reference point is like working at a GameStop for many years. And, like, that is still a specific audience, right? Like, we got a lot of casual people that would come in there, but there were still, like, a lot of hardcore gamers in there. Yeah. And, like, for example, I was... I remember S Square and Enix coming together, which was which was a pretty big deal. Like, yeah. people kind of forget that. Like, people forget that they were separate companies, I think. And that was, like, pretty quickly recognized by the, by the majority of people. You know? It's like, I think big mergers like that make a splash. And Microsoft, which isn't just a video game company buying the company that makes Call of Duty, I think is like a bigger, a bigger non-gaming splash than maybe something like something, something comparable. It but is, I don't know. but I, I think like even that logo changing and if like, if they announce that, Hey, Square and Enix will be merging uh, a year and a half from now. Like, I don't know how much of a splash that would have made. I think it's, it's going to be bigger, but I mean, I, I think it's going to be until the first Call of Duty is exclusive that a majority of Call of Duty players are aware that and others never, and they, no one will ever and know. And they call it like Microsoft's Call of Duty. <laughs> that oh my gosh. So stupid. <laughs> um, I think that slash, you know, it's already been like Jason Trier recently like wrote up or at least shared from Bloomberg about the next Call of Duty is being on PlayStation, at least allegedly, according to like inside sources. So it seems like again. 23, 24, whatever. Yeah. So yes, this um, year's and then, and then next year's. And then there's also going to be a new version of Warzone, like a Warzone 2 effectively that's going to be releasing within the next two years. And those are going to be on PlayStation as well. But then after that, it seems like no one knows. Exactly. So I think if it goes exclusive, that's a very obvious tell. But even I think... I would be shocked if we didn't don't see even in the next Call of Duty some little like indicators of yes this is owned by Microsoft or they have a form of deal or relationship because we saw the same thing on PlayStation and PlayStation never owned Call of Duty and they still had that kind of timed extras or whatever. So I think rather quickly, if not already immediately, I think because this has garnered so much like national attention as like a business move, yeah. people are a lot more likely to know even if they never I think even people who played Call of Duty for some reason didn't know Activision owned Call of Duty, they would still find out all that information then at once through this story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Beefcake has a question. Uh, and they say, $70 billion is a lot of money. Question mark? No, he says, uh, why buy Activision? With that kind of money, you can build your own Activision. You could spend $1 billion... 70 times and build 70 new studios. <laughs> Why is Call of Duty and Candy Crush so important when you could build your own? You can't do that. <laughs> like, but like, I'm no like a developer, but like you can't, it, it's not a one-to-one. -one. Like money is a lot and you need money, but without expertise and good projects and all this other stuff, that isn't necessarily going to move the needle. And I think we see that with like companies like Stadia and Amazon, like all these other players entering the gaming space and realizing that it's not enough to have money and even hiring some really expert people too. You need to have so much going well to make something, not, let alone to make something that as viral and powerful mm. as Call of Duty and Candy Crush. Like those are so transcendent. Like they're probably 
I, I will be surprised when or if we'll ever see something as immense as Call of Duty in terms of sales numbers because we haven't yet for a long time. It's dominated for so long. Like, yeah. not to <laughs> let alone like the logistics of the time it takes to develop, the people you'd have to hire for that stuff. They have insurance, you know, then the people who you're leading to do that. You're by the time you get any of those projects off the ground, like, we might all be in space already. Like Bezos bought the company and it doesn't matter that you spend 70 billion to build 70 studios or however that number shakes out. Like it's, it, the TLDR is, it is absolutely not a one-to-one. -one. It is much easier to buy. It's, that's like saying, why, why do you hire workers when you could just get high school interns and train them to, like you do that to a degree, well, right? And that yeah. th there is value in, in in-house talent, but not every company would, op it doesn't, it does not translate the same way. It doesn't, but don't you think it's yeah. a fun idea? <laughs> it it is it is a fun idea but they were they wanted to buy money makers yeah. and a, and a studio costs money you don't you don't want to just spend a bunch of money on things that are going to continue costing you money like that you know Phil Spencer taking that to his boss and saying hey you know give me the money to do this is a lot harder than saying Hey, this you know these three franchises or whatever they said, these three franchises are each both a billion dollar, which still the math still does that still blows my mind, but but it's it's that kind of you're you are investing in something and it's also it's it's speculative too that that's like the whole thing with Embracer Group to some extent that we were talking about like when they bought Asmodee they bought it for several billion dollars and the company that. The company previously that owned Asmodee yeah. also bought it, but they bought it for like two hundred million, and then they bought a bunch of different other companies, which in, which inflated the value, and then they just kind of passed that along. Like I think, even though Microsoft's not going to just like sell off their entire gaming division or anything like that, but I think it's you're buying stuff that is just adding more value, and that's that's more important than like just making a bunch of really good games, I think, at the end of the day. Yeah, it's very, very hard to build a new studio. And like Janet said, like the talent, the fact that Activision has 10,000 employees, like, okay, let's find 10,000 super talented people to build up these new studios in the gaming space. Like that is, that is a tall order. And then make new IPs from scratch and then yes. figure out how to make those new IPs popular. And just... Well, they have blinks, the Time Sweepers. So they could, I mean, they have the IPs they could go to. But I mean, Microsoft has right. really had a tough time with this, even with studio like The Initiative built from Why scratch. Why does Blinks keep getting dragged on this show? Like, what's <laughs> going know. on? Ben, like, yeah. what is your beef with Blinks? I got no sweeper? beef with Blinks. I don't know if I've ever actually touched and controlled Blinks the Time Sweeper. So, you know, maybe we need to fix that. Maybe that's a new show plus option is just a let's play of Blinks the oh, Time Sweeper. Oh, 100 Please, <laughs> please let me show up for that oh, because I've, se I've seen someone try Blinks the Time Sweeper in 2021, but I haven't seen anyone try it in 2022. So I think it'll be a whole it might be new good world. Again. Is it on Game Pass? <laughs> Yeah, hell yeah. All right, Blinks it up, it man. You're well, rewinding time. There's some good ideas in Blinks the Time Sweeper. Okay, so it's not like you're talking about... Oh, that old, that old yeah. <laughs> Good ideas. This? Yeah, it's some good ideas, Blinks. Yeah, they're uh, worth billions. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah, the idea of Microsoft building up a new studio from scratch, like The Initiative, which they did for Perfect Dark, and then just this last year, they're like, you know what? We actually need Crystal Dynamics, even after all this money being poured in the studio, to help co-develop the new Perfect Dark. Like, it is so hard to build a studio from scratch. They're doing that with 70 studios at the same time with billions for I want to see him 70, try. 71 billion dollar companies though it does it that it's such a it's such a mind blowing way to <laughs> to know. look at how much money they spent. Yes. I, I, I still someone I think in our Slack channel mess you know like just mentioned like man I don't know if 5 years from now we're going to look back at this the way that we do the Star Wars deal mm. that was Four billion, and everyone thinks that's an absolute steal nowadays. Even though that blew everyone's minds, you know, five years ago or yeah. whatever. But seventy billion for Activision? I I don't know how we're gonna feel about that. <laughs> did, did, was anybody else intrigued? This was gonna be my get a load of this, but hopefully it was nobody else's. But I thought it was wild, and maybe just I haven't listened to too many gaming podcasts yet this week. But the fact that Blizzard announced a new IP this week. And it felt like discussion radio silence. And it's just like a bizarre indicator of how far Blizzard has fallen and the reputation and how it's just seen as radioactive. Like, this should be the talk of the game industry this week. And I know there's a lot going on, Pokemon Legends and Horizon previews, lifting and all this stuff. But still, it's like the fact that Blizzard announced they're making a new IP and it's a survival game. It's like, this is 
huge news to me, and I it got me. Like, even though with all of Blizzard's foibles and fables and all that nonsense, like, and obviously they have a lot of work to do, and hopefully they've purged uh, the bad actors from the studio at this point, but still there's a part of me where it's like, I, I'm kind of excited about it. I want to see Blizzard's survival game. I want to see what that studio can put together in this genre. Yeah, I mean, I I saw that announcement. I think part of the radio silence is when your announcement is, hey, look, we're we're announcing untitled survival game. It's right. Like, how, how much work have you actually put into this? And, you know, like, or are you just throwing out anything that you can at this point to make yourselves look a little better? Well, they had like two well, pieces of art. People, yeah. Right? I mean, it's like a hiring yeah. announcement, which kind of deflates it a little too. I, I, for, from the c- consumer perspective, because it's it that is all the news that, that exists is survival game from Blizzard. But there's, I mean, several there was, pieces. There of was art, even like concept art or something. I think maybe it would be a little different. Oh, there is. There's several pieces of concept art that they released along I with it. Yeah, maybe I guess me a trailer. I, okay. The concept art just like I I even forgot existed because it just shows someone looking out in the distance, right? It doesn't really look right. There's uh, yeah. There's it. there's another one where you get to see on the close up of the style, which looks bizarre. I think to me, part of the like silence of it is like, it getting eclipsed, I think, by the acquisition news and then yeah. it also being like flavored with like the jankiness that still is Activision Blizzard in terms of public perception and then underscored by the fact that usually I feel like people get more excited about vague thing from studio when it's a studio that maybe doesn't put out stuff as often and it's something that people have been kind of clamoring for. And while I think there's definitely like a survival game like fan base, it's so like there's not a lot to like there wasn't like a lot of hunger for that specifically so i think it just doesn't get the same virality as even something like oh okay confirmation on three new star wars games one of them right. is ta- okay well we knew this thing. and there, it kind of like creates a conversation there isn't too much to really talk about after you say like they're making this and maybe it'll be cool like there's not as much to to discuss or break down and analyze I yeah think. that could be yeah by the way just do so you we- think do you think it would have made a bigger impact if instead of calling it a survival game they just said like a a totally new blizzard game because those are rare those don't come by very often. But, but giving it more detail, one, how right? is that going to make less of an impact? I'm saying maybe it'll make more of an impact because, like, then you because I think the survival aspect may be deflated a little bit. But if it was just oh. new Blizzard game IP or whatever, maybe people would have been like, you know, more. Hmm. Interested. I don't know. Yeah, survival is interesting to me, but yeah, that, that could be it. That, that could be something there. Just a weird time to announce it. But again, it's just yeah. for recruiting. Um, let's see. Actually, there was um there's an interesting little tweet thread from that game's creator here where he tweeted, Once upon a time, this dream project was a humble pitch desk, desk, so a humble pitch deck on my desktop. Now it's a team full of caring and passionate people sharing a vision I couldn't be prouder to be a part of. Part of the dream for me is seeing future leaders rise to the ranks that don't look like me or come from my background. I'm here to serve and support that. If you're considering whether this is the team for you, I highly recommend reaching out to some of my unannounced survival game teammates who've offered to answer questions about their experience. No team is perfect, so this may help get an honest impression. It's like, you know, always that sweet moment of developer being like, look, this started from nothing and now look at it. But I like that even he's like trying to couch it for like, look, we understand we're Blizzard right now. Please talk to people. I think we can make it good. Um, let's see. Beaten Down Brian uh, jumps in. He says, hey, everybody. Hope everyone's happy and well. Sure. Relative. Check. There it is. It's still, well, it's 2022 now. So, hey. <laughs> New year. Time keeps moving and we're still here. Uh, in these could, squares. could this be, asked Beaten Down Brian, the last generation where we buy games? Okay, let me walk that back a little. Hmm. The option to buy games will always be there, but lately I've been wondering if we're heading towards a future that removes the need to buy them. Granted, this scenario needs a lot of ifs and buts to happen before it could be a reality, but let's just say PlayStation launched a service to rival Game Pass. Well, everybody says it's happening. And for the sake of argument, it does. All first party and some third party games are available day one, etc. The two are now on even footing, which leads to even more competition. Is there a future where next generation, we're not buying games? I think that's no. looking like... Oh, no? I was going to say yes. No. Because I, th- I don't think... I think even if third party gets eaten by all these first party companies, it will take longer than into the next generation. And I also don't necessarily think that will happen. Um, it's just a technical possibility. Yeah. I mean, Nintendo's always there. There, won't be, there won't be a Steam option, potentially ever, right? Because there's too many disparate publishers and developers and that kind of thing. A, oh, a Steam Game Pass thing? Yeah. And same for maybe Steam Epic Pass. Game Store. Yeah, Steam Pass. Um, and I, I don't think Nintendo ever no. will. I don't oh, think they'll give away... Sure. 
I don't think they'll ever give away Mario Kart 9 as part of a subscription. No. Why did I forget Nintendo? Yeah, there's no world where Nintendo's not making me pay full price for a game I already own. You know what I mean? Like, I'm buying stuff I already have at Nintendo. Yeah. Yeah. The toe is dipped, right, with classic games like Super Nintendo and N64 games being part of a subscription service. But, like, I don't don't think I would ever be able to play the new Zelda because I subscribe to Nintendo, right? But, I mean, if Sony and Microsoft are heading in this direction so clearly, like, I could see next generation, the idea of buying a Sony or Nintendo or Sony or Microsoft game being like, oh, yeah, that seems silly. I mean, you, technically, if you wanted to, you could get pretty darn close with just Game Pass right now for Microsoft. If, if you only wanted to play a couple, I mean, it it's it's kind of like the, it's kind of like early Netflix days where it's like, if you want a specific movie, you're not going to find it, but they're going to give you enough movies that you can probably find something that you, you could watch. Like you right. could go, you could go a year or I guess a generation just playing whatever Microsoft gives you on Game Pass and you'd still play a lot of good games. I would love, and maybe someone wouldn't have to live this necessarily for us to get this data, but a like one gen or even just one year, like no spent, no buying games challenge. Right. And how many games can you end up playing? And at what timeline? It's like, oh, I played Ragnarok, but like five years later, <laughs> you know, like yeah. what does that look like? Kind of similar to what we saw when I think, you know, PS Plus and Games of the Gold started getting traction, there'd be all those like, and people still do this, but like all these price breakdowns on like how much value do you actually get out of it? Um, it's definitely a fascinating concept. And I, I, I don't think we're going to, it's going to take a long time for us to get there if we ever do. Like people in, in chat are bringing up the like the music and movies thing. But again, music and movies are so much older than games. We've had music since like the start of humanity, like literally, <laughs> quite literally. Yeah, yeah. It's the first um, occupation like movies obviously that took longer to come by but it's also there's just so many differentiations with that like i can watch a a video on anything i can stream it on but i can't necessarily like that's why porting exists right you you don't have to port batman begins to like i mean you you do in the sense of like if you want like on a umd i guess of like on physical hardware but i'm not porting it from my phone to my tv i'm just playing it on these services so i think we have a long way to go before it's that cohesive and I can just jump between devices off the giant the ultimate game game pass speaking of the ultimate game did someone just turn on a PS5 um I believe Isaiah turned on <laughs> okay good, turn on, I thought I was this losing is, my mind for a this second this is my boyfriend in the background I have noise reduction on what did you, what did you turn on what are you playing over there <laughs> can you say is it Embar- it's Monster Train because uh, it would be Embar- he doesn't okay, do content like that fine. but yeah he's out here playing on game pass so um, yeah <laughs> I think, do you, you think you'll be buying games next generation Still, that are not Nintendo games. Uh, we gotta see what Sparkus looks like. We, it depends on what Sparkus looks like. There you go. Okay. So there you, you heard it here first from the background of my apartment. We got it. it this is a new <laughs> game we like to play in this podcast. Guess the sound that Isaiah is making in the background. Honestly, uh, it's a that smoothie. Would be, uh, new show plus. Just let it happen. <laughs> Uh, Up there with Leo's Guess the Number game. Oh, mm-hmm. all-time classic. That's actually, it's in my top three for games of 2022 so far. Uh, huh. Ricky Winterborn writes in, he says, what's your favorite shop from a game? And then he asks, what are you buying? And inversely, what are you selling? So he's, is he's it like, hmm? like by shop is, do they mean like, um, how you go to like the Pokemart or whatever and you buy the potions like that yeah. kind of shop? Yeah. What else, what else would it be? I don't know. Maybe like in-game <laughs> cosmetics, like, oh, you know, I see, I see. You, per- you know what I mean? Ooh, like, sure. well, maybe, oh, sure. maybe you didn't cause you, you had asked, so I guess it was not clear, but okay. Um, Anthony's never looked at one of those actually. I'm too so. good for that stuff. Jen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Never not no, no dropping ten dollars for a special horse for you. Mm, I do think I was actually thinking about this today. I think the only games that I've spent microtransaction money in is Jurassic World Builder, or whatever the hell that iOS game was. I lost thousands. Um, no, I don't know, <laughs> like five bucks, and then I spent. I think I spent like ten bucks on some loot crates for Overwatch when I was really into it back in twenty sixteen. I think that might be it for microtransactions, which I'm strangely proud of. Um, but anyways, hey, get back to the question. Please, Kyle, I don't need congratulations. What is the best shop in a game? I mean, I don't, I don't, I couldn't even tell you why, but the Resident Evil 4 merchant does yeah. immediately come to mind. I don't, I don't know why. I don't understand why that guy is so compelling. Is uh, He's just mysterious in a weird way in the context of that game. Like, you never learn anything about him or why he's there or why he has stuff or why he wants to help you or are there multiple versions of him or just <laughs> one? Versions. I don't know. He's just this interesting do, dude who says things in a funny way. Do you think Resident Evil Village's Duke kind of 
did all they could with that idea of like people love the shopkeeper it's one of the things people talk about from previous games let's just blow them out in a big way not just size wise yeah. but also like role wise do you think they, they succeeded on that mission uh, they, they succeeded making an interesting character yeah uh, I like the shopkeeper in Resident Evil Village but I mean there's the fact that uh, Four's shopkeeper is just so separate from the story makes him more unique right know, right weird. Um, and I've been hanging out with him in VR. It's a much more compelling experience. Oh, that does sound great. You can put your arm around him. Can you open his coat? No. <laughs> okay, that'd be cool. To see People have probably tried. Yeah, but Lord you do have another like, problem put, that VR has. <laughs> you do, to sell stuff, you have to like p- pick stuff out of your inventory and put it on a table and then like press a button for him to buy it. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. It's kind of fun. Yeah, I think it, like, I'm trying to think of, a, was it Rusty's Real Deal Baseball? Which oh, was that point. microtransaction choice on 3DS, but in that shop you actually had to like argue with the people for why you should actually get a discount on these things. That's a fun thing to actually have to argue in a video game to actually get a discount in real life for the real purchase is bizarre. That's up there. I like uh, Nook's Cranny. Yeah. Because I like those little guys following me around. I don't know if that counts, <laughs> Jeff. Because they, it, they talk me into it every time. I They're think like, it, oh, I you're, looking at, you're looking at that fan? You want that fan? It's only here for one day. It's like, I guess. It's 800 bells. Sure, why not? Yeah, sweet feast on you. Uh, Chris Nielsen writes in and says, Hey, Min Maxers, what factors make a game world feel alive to you? Uh, Lots of movement. Movement. Like, just movement everywhere. People doing things. Even if it's like loops that I don't recognize unless I sit there and stare at them forever. If, if stuff is just happening on its own that feels like I'm not involved with it, that, that goes a long way. Hmm. That's interesting. I think when the AI surprises me, um, so it's kind of similar to what Kyle's talking about, but realizing that they can do things that you wouldn't think that they can do. And I think like Breath of the Wild has a lot of those like wild moments of oh man, like the I didn't realize the, this enemy could throw this thing, this bomb back at me or anything like that. Like the idea that characters besides you have their own like intelligence and motivation and thoughts and are like operating um i think also to a degree the day night cycle can be nice sometimes it's um very stark (laughs) it's like it's day now it's an evening it's pitch black it's pitch black for like the next five minutes and i'm like all right this is kind of a little heavy-handed but i think stuff like that can be helpful yeah yeah characters interacting with each other even even when it's real dumb, like two different factions and those factions start fighting each other. But that always feels like, oh, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to watch them. And that's that's just happening out there in the world. It doesn't it's not it's totally not because I just walked through that doorway, you know, and triggered it. But they're just living their best lives. Do you think um, the Final Fantasy VII remake pulled this off? I'm trying to think of just like they pack so many people into the streets of Midgar and they're all screaming did it, but they all look so different from the other characters. I think some stuff, well, this is like so petty and I feel like people yeah. are going to be a little mad that I even feel like this, but uh-huh. there's something, some stuff about Midgar that I wish was done a little bit differently. Like the stores, like not being able to like shop at the store or like all the clothes kind of looking the same, like little stuff that felt like, I think it was really beautifully made and it looked really nice, but mm-hmm. I kind of felt like I was on the outside looking in at it. Like I don't mm. feel like I could do a lot interacting with what was going on other than the things that the game clearly was like, you can talk to this person because this is how you complete like this quest line. So I wish it was a little bit more simmy, I think, in that area for me hmm. personally. Yeah. Okay. All right. Like I want to go shopping. Just more shopping options. I get it. Yeah. Uh, it is weird. Like Square, Square is like really guilty of it, but it's weird when like, the main cast is like every single one is a very talented uh, fashion designer with like a very right. unique sense of fashion and like no one else is. <laughs> <laughs> it's all t-shirts and blue jeans except for these eight people who have each designed their own outfit meticulously. They do a lot of home sewing. You know, well, That's what defines a hero, Kyle. Oh, that's that what right? made him rise up, yeah. Uh, Matt writes in, he says, Hello, MinMax, my fiancé. Recently, Nostalgia purchased the old humongous game called Putt-Putt Travels Through Time and actually had a fun time playing it. It turns out time loop games were not just a 2021 thing. I refuse to believe that. Uh, are there any games nice. from your childhood that you've returned to and did they hold up? Personally, I'm afraid to tarnish my good memories of Chex Quest and Crunch- Crunchling Adventure with a replay. 
Uh, also, as a better quest goal, look at this! First person to write in with a better quest goal. Uh, I'm going to brush up on my Python basics and look into classes online. Hell yeah. All right, Learn nice. to code, buddy. Um, what is Crunchling Adventure? Does anybody know this one? Is no. it another, like, licensed thing? That oh, it's a Cap'n Crunch game. I, I know Chex West so well, but I've never seen this. There's a big screen all about Gatorade. Yeah, I this think game. It's like interested. It looks perfect. I, I think it's like a pet sim. I think. <laughs> well, there's. I'm jumping around this let's play, and it's jumping from like skateboarding to dodging rocks by a volcano. It looks like everything at once. Yeah. Yeah, oh, you had to like level everything. up this character. Like I, they had speed stats and jumping stats and strength stats, and you would like huh. repeat the same tasks a lot and stuff like that to please the captain. Yes, must please the captain. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, I had a weird experience where over Christmas I was at my fiance's house and somehow they brought up um, Fatty Bear's birthday surprise. It was like my fiance's first game she ever played. And we like all watched a Let's Play of this old adventure game called... Oh, no, it was an emulator, actually. We got it up and running. And it's an old humongous game, which is like Ron Gilbert, you know, Mr. Uh, Monkey Island and whatnot. Um, it's on Steam. It is. Yeah, so many of these old humongous games are on Steam. And it's just like a well of nostalgia for so many people that I did not even know existed. But like the family was almost in tears, like reliving these memories of Fatty Bear's birthday <laughs> also, surprise. Also, was this good? Because it, it looks kind of it, good. It's I'm not like bad. watching the Steam trailer now. It, it is actually not bad. It looks kind of scary. <laughs> is it scary? It's the scariest game I've ever played in my life, Janet. The way that the bear comes to life is a little alarming. Yeah, the birthday surprise is the same birthday surprise that we talked about on uh, the bonus podcast for New Show Plus. Oh, this no week. spoilers! Yeah, no spoilers. I might not play this. I don't <laughs> know. Right, I've, right. I, there's so many games to play that. Um, I lot. I mean, I think a lot of my childhood games hold up because I had. I played a lot of, like the big hits. Um, when you don't get a lot of games, you kind of only get the best ones. So I, I didn't take a lot of like. You know, I didn't play a lot of flyers um, as a kid, but you know, like stuff like I still love like Pokemon Stadium um, and the the kids club there, Yoshi's Island. Um, I like that game, Yoshi's Cookies. That one's a little bit okay of a hot take. Some people really don't like Yoshi's Cookies. I don't know why. It's Yoshi Tetris. What, it what's is. the problem? I think it's just confusing. Also, it's weird that it's an NES game, but then Yoshi made his debut in the Super Nintendo game, so it's automatically seen as like that cheaper, weird, old gen release. Yoshi's Cookies got a lot of problems. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like the way the eggs can come down and then there's another Yoshi like I think yeah. it's great like okay. I love I got no I have no feedback for that game it's just good it's just All a good right. game solid work was it Game Freak that made that I want to say let's I don't, see. No, really no Hang I on. don't know who I, made that game you might be right I think so Hanson like of course it joke. wasn't Game Freak no <laughs> they did um they did Wario's Wood is that what it was yeah one of those oh. weird old things um, yeah, I don't know. Anybody else got one from childhood that does hold up? I played um, Shadows of the Empire in the last three years, and I still really enjoyed that game. Like, people are kind of down on that Star Wars game, but it's still one of my favorites. And I, I played it so much on 64 that when I actually played it now, I think I got it on uh, good old games. Like, it was... it. I, I had a lot of muscle memory for completing it. So I think where some people might have found it to be very difficult... I didn't find it very difficult because I just remembered how to, the little tricks that I figured out playing the game so many times over and over back when I was younger. Yeah, that game's fine. Um, hang on, Kyle. Look, I'd love, to talk about, I'd love to talk about Star Wars. <laughs> I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it. Okay, so I had it confused. So there, Game Freak did develop Yoshi, which is an NES right, game, okay. which apparently is different than Yoshi's Cookie, which is a Super Nintendo game. I think I've only played Yoshi. I don't know if I've played Yoshi's Cookie. And I was thinking, when I said Wario's Woods, I was wrong. I was thinking of Mario and Wario, which right. is a game that never came Wait, out in America. hold on. I'm thinking of, this is like, this sounds like I'm <laughs> trolling you. I'm thinking of Yoshi, not Yoshi's Cookie. It's like, okay, so there's... Yeah. What's the difference? I'm, I'm looking at... Yoshi's Cookie looks all, like, fancy and stuff. There's, like, cookies involved. <laughs> uh, hang on. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm Yoshi, like... you just have Mario spinning plates at the bottom. Yes. Right. Yeah, Yoshi's yes. what I'm thinking of. But sometimes I've seen this game... This it, this is what it looks like. Yes, I've seen and the Game Boy version. Cookies, yep. But it's just Yoshi. Yeah, then Yoshi's Cookie... Yeah, it's like Mario moving a lever. Look, we're sorry, Nintendo fans. Uh, Kelsey <laughs> Lewis... <laughs> Are, are they both considered bad? I like this one regardless. Like, you can't tell me nothing about Yoshi, but, like, which one's the bad one? <laughs> I, no one knows. <laughs> I the good one. Bad. No one knows. 
Um, did we There's answer no the question? Do we have a thought on this one? <laughs> All right, yeah, I, play, I grew up playing Link to the Past and Super Metroid. Oh, tell me, here tell we me go. they're bad. What, uh, what do you arts. want? I don't know. Uh, Shane C writes in. He says, My wife and I just agreed to buy a house, and the looming prospect of emptying our savings account has me terrified. This is objectively a little silly. The entire reason we saved that money in the first place was to buy a house, after all. Still, I've been pretty stressed about the whole thing, but then I realized I was doing the real-life version of hoarding potions and buffs in an RPG because I, quote, might need them later. That thought <laughs> made me laugh, and it also helped me recognize that we're doing the smart thing, using our resources at the appropriate time rather than holding onto them for a future scenario that may never come to pass. I say all that to ask, have you ever caught yourself falling into video game behavior patterns? And has it ever turned out to be helpful? I love that I know exactly what you're feeling, Shane. Like, starting min-max, it was a scary idea of like, okay, if I buy all the equipment I need, that's going to be like $10,000 out of my pocket. That's even impossible. But I was like, I guess I've been saving money my whole life and I don't really know why. Like, it might as well be for this. And like, and then luckily the community supported us and I was able to pay that back. Um, yeah, does anybody know this feeling of when a v video game pattern slips into real life? Mine, yeah. My answer was hoarding. And, and I do that with all kinds of stuff. <laughs> but the other day, I'll tell you what. Mm -hmm. my, I, I, had, <laughs> I had a big bag of corks, of wine corks. And my wife was like, throw what? those out. I don't know. Every time I drink a bottle of wine, I just put the cork on a shelf. And then what? one day, they all went into a bag. I don't know why. You're a lunatic. She said, throw it out. I didn't throw it out. Then just two days ago... I opened a new bottle of wine and the cork broke off halfway, so I couldn't reuse it. I went downstairs. I opened up my bag of corks. I got stop. a perfectly good cork you out stop. and I put that in the bottle of wine. You gotta save the day. So this you're, is all. You're Jeff from Cork. <laughs> hey, 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 Janet, Janet, Janet. Thank you. Um, I should, I should just mail him. Applauding me I is should... a red flag on itself. Like maybe I should. Yeah. Maybe I have the wrong audience. <laughs> <laughs> audience of one. Good. I'm all in. <laughs> Uh, this is a dangerous message to send out there, Jeff. I'm to, hey, everybody, start hoarding because you buy might house come across the situation. Go ahead, buy that house. Don't uh -huh. second guess it. Why don't you buy a reusable cork? Uh, they have a cute <laughs> yeah, master cork perfect. one that I like. I used to have. I need to buy reusable it again actually because I lost it. Yeah, um, Google master cork. What I, I think that's all you need to Google. And like at Walmart even or Amazon, they sell. Um, that's the one don't I like using. It, it looks Jeff, like a, whatever you do, don't miss. Come on. That is oh true. It's high risk, high reward. <laughs> you know. Add in wine or something just to really pat it out. But it's just a rubber cork, and you can get like different ones uh, that are rubber or metal or whatever. Yeah. Um, I've been meaning to buy one actually because I too run into the you know you don't I rarely go through the entire bottle of wine, so I'll have to re put the cork in. They're, they're easier to put in than the than the cork too. Yeah. See, oh yeah. The problem is the cork is hell. <laughs> it's I, all on earth. I I just googled I that. But <laughs> life. I just I just googled master cork, but now I'm seeing a wine cork display case that looks pretty fancy, no. and I still got a bag of corks. Look, I, what are you <laughs> gonna like? Hold on. Attack a robber it. with the bag of corks. I, I here's a, if I'm ever on something for your freaky cork collection, is they have little like kits. I bought some of these where you can like turn old corks into like animals. Like it's like little pins and you turn corks into like bears and crows and stuff. It's very fun. Okay, I sent it on I sent it on Discord. It's oh, just like man. it's this a Legend of Zelda inspired master, sword, master sword cork stopper. Mm. It's cute, it's game related, it's useful. Um I had it years ago from I used to have like those little subscription bundles like nerd block or arcade block or whatever and it yeah. came in one of those but i just lost it since like having moved and i haven't purchased it again you can find normal non-nerd ones if you want something more like plain but they have a, a kajillion of these one kajillion nice uh, i think we officially ruined this question so yeah do anybody else have a thought <laughs> video game stuff real life stuff i think, that, I think that's good oh kyle's <laughs> thinking kyle's thinking really i hard. try to drive in the uh, opposite lane to build up uh you know um nitro doesn't really work as well in real life, though. Huh, interesting. <laughs> uh, Andrew Burns. <laughs> Get it. I, pre I appreciate the effort. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Andrew like Burns it. writes in, he says, What critically celebrated game from 2021 do you think will be looked back on the least fondly? Chicory. Oh, man. <laughs> what? Oh, hang on, there's fine print. He says, other than Bravely Default 2. No, I'm just kidding. But not really, though. Uh, I don't kidding. know. Do we have a list? I don't know. Um, like, I, uh, I, he, he actually says, he says, I'm thinking it might be Halo Infinite. 
And I think that's an interesting yeah. choice. I think there that's might be something there. And maybe one. it's just because I soured so hard on that game in the second half with the story that, but I, I don't know, years from now, will people knock the story in Halo Infinite or just the fact that it's a platform moving forward that people won't even remember what the story was at launch because it'll have all these little expansion stories and stuff. Yeah. I haven't been super eager to go back to it or anything. Not because yeah. I thought it was a bad game by any means. Just was happy to move on once I beat the campaign. I was kind of thinking this morning, I was like, I think it, I think it's our failure as an outlet that we didn't get together to play multiplayer Halo Infinite. The fact that that didn't happen seems impossibly lame. There's right? still time. I guess there's still time. You're right. I'm sure, it was on the new show Plus, right? I'm You're right. Point. You're right. It was. But does everything have to be a show, Kyle? Can't we just do it for the fun of it, man? I know if you. I'm Showtime. Fun, I'm not showtime. Boon up Halo. Oh, I usually dare don't. You. <laughs> those two things oh, don't no. go together yet. There's still time. Maybe I'll become, I don't know, is there a name for Halo fans? Wades? <laughs> sure. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, I just think it too, maybe there's something with like Ratchet and Clank. Like that's such a iterative franchise that by the time the next one comes out, I don't know if anyone will be like, no, 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 Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart was like the banger. Of is that a standout one? Yeah, with, I don't know. With a series know. that's so good to begin with. Right. Board, pretty consistent. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I think like low-key, I'm looking at like the 210s list that we have, which mm-hmm. I'm like, these are like really good games. I'm like, wow, we're so good at what we do here. Uh-huh. But I think Guardians of the Galaxy, um, Not, I don't think people are going to look back and be like, secretly, that game wasn't good. But I think the conversation, I think the, what we'll remember is that it had great writing and middling combat, more so than it being like an 8 or something like that. Uh, 8 being... Like an 8 out of 10. Like I, know, I don't I think know. we'll remember it as just a great game. I think we'll remember it as a game that had great writing and so-so combat. I, I don't know. I was thinking, I was just listening to a, the Ted Price podcast where he's talking to the, the writer and creative director for that game, some people we interviewed. Um, but I was thinking about that game. I think that game's going to get more and more special as the years go on. As there's more Marvel games, more Star Wars games, I think like five years from now it's going to be held in, which is weird to say for a Marvel game, but I think it's going to be like a weird cult classic level status because um, mm-hmm. it's just going to be such a weird anomaly. Like, I remember Eidos Montreal released that standalone Guardians game and then never did another one. Because uh, it doesn't seem like they're doing another one. But uh, let's see, Doreen Claire writes in and asks, what do y'all think about fortune tellers other than us on this episode? Um, are they all a sham or have you ever been or have you ever had a cool slash weird moment with psychics or anything like that? I don't think so. I, uh, I, I don't believe in fortune tellers, but my family is very, um, they're not listening to this, right? They're very, they, <laughs> they, they err on the edge of being kind of woo woo family, like not full crystals, but they're they would look at buying a crystal like at times in their life, that level of family, you know? And like both my dad and my mom were really into like psychics growing up and talking about like these amazing experiences they had in their past. So I always thought it was cool. But then as I grew up, I was like, oh no, there's, there's nothing going on there. Although <laughs> I read Michael Crichton's kind of autobiography called Travels uh, last year, uh, which is fascinating. And there's a whole section where he got really into psychics which is interesting because, you know, he's supposedly a man of science, this Michael Crichton fella. And so he was big on going into psychics and wearing a hat and wearing like a thick jacket, but like giving no indicators of anything and then trying to talk as little as possible so they don't even know where he was from, if he had an American accent or what. And then he writes in this chapter how he was wowed and they eventually converted him over and he realized that there is something magical going on. And that's kind of the arc of the book. That'd be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, but- I'm not- we should I'm not it. really like a believer by any by any means, but I I enjoy like it in terms of a fun fact thing. Like I like getting yeah. fortune cookies and I have like um, one of the little magic eight balls. I use it for like a channel point redemption where it's like, oh, ask the magic eight ball like Ooh. this thing. Ooh, and, and magic fun. eight ball, magic eight ball. Um, uh, sure. Are fortune tellers real? Are fortune tellers real? Yeah. Okay, the answer is leave me alone because this is a lazy egg magic eight ball. So the sometimes hell? the answers, sometimes the answers are like lazy or rude. Uh, there are like real <laughs> ones, like not likely, but sometimes it's just like, eh, I don't care. It's not fun and I'm just like, to be that's, rude. Fair enough. That's honestly more accurate than a regular magic eight ball. I guess that's fair. Jeff, I'm you're all in on this nonsense, right? Oh yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, Adam <laughs> Castellanos writes in, says, "A little music question for y'all." What was the best concert y'all have been to? And also, have you, have you ever tried to crowd surf or mosh pit at a concert? Thank you. 
Um, mosh pitting stuff, yeah. The crowd surf, no. I'm too tall for that. That's no good. I did at uh, at an AFI concert, Hanson. Shut up. That was you? That was me. <laughs> in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Oh, my God. 2002? Wait, so you crowd surfed? Yeah. What was that experience like? It was weird. It was fun, though. Yeah? Okay, we're, yeah. We're, you just... We're like, I'm going up, boys, and then it, yeah, it was like it, with a, with friends, and we like took turns getting vaulted up by each other. You know, it's like, all right, now you get up on top of there. All right, now you get up on top of there. Yeah, um, but it was like a good enough crowd, and people were into it enough that it was, you know, people were excited. Like you can't do if no one's into it, you're not gonna be able to pull it off. But. Yeah, <laughs> I know you're this, just falling on top of people. <laughs> it's it's weird. Yeah. yeah, I know this isn't a uh, maybe a cool thing no more, but at the time in my life, it was very cool. Like one time, one time at an AFI show. I was probably like early college and I was in the crowd and they started playing a song. I wish I could remember which song. It was probably like Days of the Phoenix or something. For all you AFI heads, you you know, just take your pick. And the lady in front of me was so excited that they were playing this song. She just turned around and just kissed me on the lips because she was so <laughs> excited. I had never met this person. I didn't know who they were. And that's when AFI became my favorite band. Was like, this seems all right. <laughs> this seems pretty cool. <laughs> You get kisses for listening to this. <laughs> yeah, that's band. right. That's right. <laughs> um, also, have we all seen AFI Live on this call? You've seen AFI Live, Janet? Mm hmm. Where? Yeah. Lollapalooza. Oh, that's awesome. When was this? Uh, whatever. Whatever year there were at Lollapalooza. It had to be in like my high school era. So sometime between t- 2000 and like nine and like 2012, because when I went to Lollapalooza, I went yeah. to like three of them. Ooh. Um, Crash my love. best concert was Foo Fighters 2011 uh, at Lollapalooza. They were the headlining act. It was like pouring rain at the time, like really insane amounts of rain. I thought for sure they were going to cancel the show, but they performed anyway. It was awesome. They're my favorite band ever. And they like give such good performances. It was just like so magical and great. And actually, I felt really sick at the time. Like, I think I got like food poisoning from like a Dairy Queen or something I went to that day. And I'm like, man, this is a great moment, but I'm not feeling great. So this is a real rough day. Um, but yeah, that, that one's really good. A, a couple other standout ones. Like I really love seeing uh, Kendrick Lamar live for his Tipima Butterfly tour was really nice as well. Um, but yeah, that's probably my favorite one. That's good. Um, yeah, despite that, I think I think my favorite concert ever um, was at Triple Rock, which is a closed down venue here in Minneapolis. Um, but seeing me first in the Gimme Gimme's, you know, like the punk oh, rock cover band. But it was just so fun and so loose. And it was my favorite show because it was like Joey Cape, who's the guitarist to me first in the Gimme Gimme's, but he also is the main singer for Lagwagon and Bad Astronaut, which was one of my favorite bands growing up and stuff. And he was just like off to the side. So it's like, all right, well, we're all going to hang out on the side of the stage where Joey Cape is. And it was just like such a loose concert that just like in between songs, they would just talk to the crowd. And like, I remember Joey Cape was like talking to the crowd on this side of the stage. And Fat Mike was talking to the crowd on that side of the stage. It was such a weird thing to like, just have this concert where it's just conversations in between each song with the band and multiple conversations to different aspects of the stage. It's like, this is just the best vibe. I was going to say, Hanson, you might appreciate this. One of my favorites, just in terms of like, it's not even like my favorite band or anything, but just like super small venue. I saw like CKY. Ooh, uh, weird. Yeah. And like, it was a really small venue and like, it was, it was, I was like right up on the stage and like after the show, we went and just chatted with every member of the mm. band for an extended period of time. Cause it was such a small show. Cause they're not like, I don't know. They've, ne- they were probably the biggest they were ever going to be at that point, <laughs> but not, you know, not, that's not that big, you know, in a Tony Hawk game. It's pretty big, Kyle. Yeah. Right. Um, it's the biggest stage. Um, I have okay. crowd surfed also, oh, um, really? not for leisure though, for practicality. I was at. La Palooza, another La Palooza, MGMT was performing. They were one of the later shows because they were pretty big at the time. This was like when they had, uh, I think, God, what's the, was the album called Celebration? It's like the one with Brian Eno on it, like the song Brian Eno. And I had gone to a lot of rock concerts at that point. Never had I been to something more violent and dangerous than the MGMT concert that day. Really? It was, it was on it. Looking back, I'm like, this is someone could like this was like da- super dangerous and like you know i'm really small too and like literally you know everyone like pushes and moshes at the time because like rock was really popular and that was like really common but it just got like so rushed immediately like one note played and everyone just got pushed for it immediately lost my whole family didn't know where anyone was you know like and everyone's like sweaty and shirtless and tall and like pressing on you so i'm like i'm just gonna get out like i'm just gonna raise my hand so i get picked up and they like 
will wave me out. And then I just text my family like, hey, where are, where is everybody? Like, what's going on? And then we just didn't see the rest of that show. Oh, wow. Great band. But like that fan base is it, no. Mm-mm, no, thank you. No, I'm good. I'm good. Which is funny because like I never it's an that. indie rock band, but right, like, right. it was so much more violent and intense than anything else I've been to. Weird. Um, if you want to hear us talk a lot more about music, uh, you can check out our music podcast, Crossfade, hosted by Jason Daphnis and Matt Helgeson, former host of the Game Informer Show podcast. It's called Crossfade, the Dueling Album Review Show. And it's been dormant, but it might be starting up again real soon. So subscribe on your favorite podcast app. It's free. Um, Jan was on talking about Foo Fighters. Kyle was on talking about Blink-182. Jeff, um, by God, will be on at some point talking about some point. Metallica. Radiohead. Radiohead. Nice. You're into metal, right, Jeff? Metallica. That's your, I don't know. What's your favorite? Tool? Is that what you're into? No. Yeah, you are. It's Radiohead. Kyle knows me. There's Kyle some other me. band like Tool that you like, though. Perfect Circle? No. Who am I thinking of? It would it would be Nine Inch Nails. Nine Inch Nails. That, that was also the best concert I went to in 1999 when wow. they did their their tool or their tour for um, the Fragile Double album that they put out. My brother got us tickets. I it was my it was also my first concert I had ever been to. Yeah, and he got them for the floor for some reason, and and it like the whole the whole place was just a giant mosh pit, and it was very sweaty and dangerous. As Janet said, but the, but they, I, I think they were, they were kind of early in the idea of like they had huge like just massive video screens behind them, and then huh. and you know like Trent Reznor had synced up imagery for you know like the entire two hour set or whatever, and it was it was an amazing experience that I then couldn't hear for like three days. <laughs> uh, this is kind of a, a better questy goal, but. Uh... I am terrible at listening to music and new music and stand up to stand up music in any way. Like I just listen to podcasts all day, every day. Um, but now every time that I play tabletop games, um, we put on the al- to put on an album and we're going off the billboard list of the top hundred albums of all time, starting at a hundred and working our way up. And it's kind of fun. And like the other day we we're like cooking pancakes and we're like, Oh, what album are we on? Okay. Number 95. What is this? And it was Metallica's Master of Puppets, which like I thought I knew, but I never listened to that album as a whole. Turns out it's very good. <laughs> Kyle, it's like a it's like a Breaking. sincere death clock. But then it's so mm-hmm. stupid. This is probably the dumbest thought in the world. But listening to it, I was like, oh, this is what that Doom music was based on. They were just recreating Metallica. I see. It all kind of locks into place. Um, Nick from Atlanta writes in. He says, hey, cohorts, what's better? All the games that let you name your character or is otherwise unnamed, or all the games where you can't change the name of the character. If you had to just lump it all together, what's what's better throughout the history of gaming? Oh, okay. Because initially I was like, what's a better mechanic? But that's not the mm, question. No. Right? All, uh, what's better? All the games that you name your character, or the wow. ones where you can't change the name. And Nick has a list here, if you want just a rundown, brief, you know, obviously this isn't all-consuming. Uh, changeable names of characters. We have Ocarina of Time. Persona 5, Mass Effect, Minecraft, Skyrim, Undertale, Unchangeable, confusingly Breath of the Wild, God of War, Horizon Zero Dawn, well, no, it's Red not Dead. confusing because it's the first time they had voice acting, uh, so they had to say uh, uh, Halo, Solar Ash, he listed. Interesting. Um, <laughs> that was purely to get Kyle on board. That is, he actually said, yes, this is pandering. Um, I think, yeah, it was funny because I've been, I've been playing uh, Mother 3, which we talked about last week, and yeah. it has that thing where every time a new character comes, like, a, oh, this character is going to be important, you can give them a name. Right. I'm always like, I don't want to do this. Like, all this will do is create confusion if I ever want to look up anything about this game. Like, Lucas needs to be Lucas. Cloud needs to be Cloud. Like, that's right. important. I don't want to change names. I don't know why this became a fad. But, fad. But in terms of the quality <laughs> of the game, that's, that's, a, that's a different question. Yeah. So the answer is to that question, Kyle. Oh man, I think it's changeable. I think maybe, but that's just yeah. a lot of nostalgia talking. No, Jana, it's not to the changeable. No, I don't think so. Like Mario, boom, that's already a lot. Um, what about Portal for Mario RPG? Can you change his name in there? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think you can. <laughs> you can probably you can change, change Mario. Even though I don't, I don't like Halo like that. Yeah, like there's. I think when I think of some of the like top games of all time, I feel like a lot of those you can't change the name. Yeah. Yeah, it's are you a big fan of RPGs or not. <laughs> yeah. I think that kind of might yeah. be it. Yeah, it's tough. And admittedly, I'm not like in you know the biggest RPG person, so yeah, you gotta be. Uh 
Christian Garcia writes in and says, Hello, my question for everyone is, but mainly Janet, as she typically has some interesting thoughts on classic games, generally considered great. <laughs> that, by the oh, way, no. that's called interesting thoughts, like Shadow of the Colossus and The Sims comes to mind. Wait, are you anti The Sims? It's because I said SimCity didn't oh, play that's right. very that's well because right. it doesn't right. tell you anything. And that's like, right. That's part of it. Like, yeah. we didn't have internet at the time. Like, come on. Like, I don't know. Come on. Um, first of all, no shade is being thrown, says Christian. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. My question is, what should the time in... Ugh, I blew it. My question is, should the time in which a game comes out always be considered when measuring an old game? No, unless you, I think the only time you'd consider the time is if we're talking about um, the significance of the game in gaming history, um, if we're making a list of like most impactful games, or if we're talking about maybe like the influence the game had, like, you know, and kind of maybe giving it its flowers in context of saying, you know, this isn't like age great, but this is one of the earliest times we've seen like this mechanic or, you know, this game sort of laid the foundation for like this other thing. Uh, that's the only thing, because I think it's so funny when people like want to use that in terms of modern day enjoyment like me knowing that like this game is from 1997 i mean it can help me understand some of why it controls the way it does but it doesn't change how it feels to play right, right. it just gives you it just informs why it feels that way while like you know maybe and it, you can kind of get away with a little bit more in that sense where like you have to go in understanding that but it doesn't do anything for the person who's playing it today in my opinion <sighs> Yeah, Christian says, in other words, should issues with jank or scope be excused when forming a current opinion on an old game simply because of the technical limits of the time it was released? Or should it be viewed as if it came out in the present and judged accordingly? Mm -hmm. Certainly not that one. It's, I, the leeway isn't as big. Like, I, I will say Mars 64, like, um, and those conversations were, like, really interesting because there were people that played that game for the first time and were like, this doesn't control great. And I'm like, yeah. well, you know, like... You, you you just you, after you play it like 800 times you just know where everything and they're like yeah the camera's kind of weird i'm like well yeah you just you just deal with it because yeah. it's worth it because of this other thing so i i do think i get that feeling and i like had that feeling during that era but at the same time like yeah i mean the camera wasn't great and like it just wasn't maybe well, there's it couldn't a, have been but like it's there's not a, that good there's, you know I, there's a canonical reason why it's not great though and just lack of his bad at his job so they everything's explained in mario 64 That's true. but aren't you you can control him. You control the camera, so you're, you're him. You're technically so you're controlling two characters at once. Yeah, it's like uh, the world ends with you situation, technically, with Mario 64. Oh, okay. Check yeah. out our deepest dive for a lot more thoughts on Mario 64 and, and the camera. Also, to be clear, I still love Mario 64. Okay, all right. I cannot, I cannot deny that <laughs> some of the stuff is not that great. I'm kind of with you. Uh, my name is Dan, writes in, and he just says, Stranger of Paradise, but sang like the chorus in Green Day's Welcome to Paradise. Does Stranger he? of Paradise. That's pretty okay. good. That's pretty good. Jeffum, can you sing uh, that? Is that a question? The question is, will Jeffum sing that? Oh, sorry. I, I completely missed the, the second half of that. Uh, do you know Green Day's Welcome to Paradise? Yes. Okay. Well, or I, I guess I missed the first half of that. What's uh, the first Stranger question? Of Paradise? Read it all Stranger again. Paradise. <laughs> don't be naive. Stranger of Paradise colon Final Fantasy Origin. What are we talking to a wall here? The most anticipated game coming out on March, March 18th. What? Excuse me. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> did you did you see that the latest trailer for it, by the way? Which I know we already kind of talked about a little bit, but it is so bizarre how then it just it kicks into Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra's my way. Like halfway through that new trailer for this Final Fantasy Souls like them. Look, that's fine. It doesn't actually ask Jeff him to sing it, so we won't put him on the spot. But I'm just going to sit back with this podcast and wait until Jeff Lemme either sings it or doesn't. Well, you just you just said or doesn't is an option. Damn it. So. Cade Mead writes in and says, hey, crew, do you go out of your comfort zone on your own or does it always take an outside push? And then what's the smallest effort you would count as actually leaving your comfort zone? <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> eh. Yeah, I don't know. Like they like in real life, right? Just in real social situations, as opposed to like my, playing a video game genre. I don't usually play, right? They mean like yeah. real. Yeah. You seem like a big comfort zone kind of guy, Kyle. In your life, I mean, I guess so. It's such a weird question because, like, I am scared of the pandemic. Uh huh. And that limits what I normally would have maybe been outside my comfort zone. I'm ready. To, I'm. I'll take the first step into outside my comfort zone, but like yeah, less I, less now than ever. 
you know. I don't, I don't think we're factoring the pandemic into <laughs> yeah. comfort zone. Like, will you go to Chili's tonight? You know, what is it going to take? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I think pre-pandemic, uh, I think both you and Jeff were big. Maybe I just take this as, like, you don't like hanging out much outside of work. <laughs> That's just yeah. comfort zone code, I mean, I've right? had a family the whole time I've known you, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> who don't who don't got Jeff a doesn't have that excuse is all I'm saying his is his is his child is recent that's right he was a single man for most of the time I knew him just sitting in a cold dark house Why refusing to hang out Hansen? that's right like years of Hanson asking <laughs> I need an excuse yeah for your hand in marriage uh I don't know Janet you seem <laughs> this is like a weird diss oh, and a compliment God. Janet you seem however like someone that's cool and likes going outside of your comfort zone <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, what's the minimum that I give myself credit for? I guess something that is really adjacent to maybe a skill I already have, like um, my boyfriend had bought an electric scooter and I like rode the electric scooter, which was outside my comfort zone. But you can argue it's only barely because I skate and it's like still a thing on wheels. Um, so something like that, I think, is minimum effort. What does it take? I guess... Um, either an outside incentive like this is a great career opportunity thing and i'll do anything that i'm interested in even if it's scary like you know and i'm, I'm often scared when i'm doing stuff i'm just like i just do it and no one notices because i'm good at what i do but i'm like hmm. even just hosting like i hosted the um panel for like before um your eyes or whatever huh and i was horrified to do that like that was so scary to me and like my boyfriend's like why and i'm like it just is like it's intent you know i've never done it like and i was like freaking out but I just did it because I like and I am good at it. So it was fine. But I'm like, oh, man, that was a lot. And like we're laying down for the rest of the day because that was like a big performance moment to me at the time because I haven't done something like that a lot. Um, but I, I'm trying to be better with it. I am default very afraid and very anxious all the time. So I'm trying not to let that stop me from getting experiences and growing as a person. But like, I don't know. We'll see when I I think my biggest hurdle in life is going to be trying to get my driver's license oh, and learn yeah. how to drive. Wow, Leo just went drive. through that. I never learned. I'm so scared to drive. I feel like I'm going to kill somebody or myself or both. It's horrifying. I have been behind the wheel of a car. Like I've tried to, you know, learn a little bit from like my family like last yeah. year, but I just stopped and I haven't gotten back to it. And I just really want to be able to take myself to the grocery store. Jesus. I know it sounds sad because I'm like a grown adult, but like I want to be able to just to like, you know, have a little bit of. Like, I could go to Ikea and buy a shelf, you know, myself. Like, I want to be able to do that. My but shelf. I'm, like, so scared of driving. So that's uh, my biggest I, I, right I now. I get it. Yeah, if you ever need advice, Leo just got his driver's license this last year. Really? And now, now he can't stop. Now he's driving Uber, actually. No, that's not true. Yeah. But it'd be interesting. <laughs> Uh, Philly Eat Steak uh, submits a question over on Patreon. They say, hey, crew, now there are over a year into the new generation. What are y'all's storage situations like on your new consoles? I have a PS5 and I'm already having an, and I already have an extra internal SSD and an extra external hard drive. Are any of you struggling with space? I think I've been, I just know the lessons from the PS4 and so I have been stingy on my PS5. It's just like, this is a two game console at any time. Mm. Right? Just has to be. Well, yeah, I just, I'm bad about just downloading a bunch of stuff and like, I might play that. Right. You know? I did buy, it's funny, my Xbox is what I play the most and what the hard drive that I fight with the most. But there was a good sale on like an upgraded internal PS5 hard drive from Best Buy like a couple months ago. So my PS5 hard drive has been sort of doubled. Uh, maybe even tripled, actually. I don't remember exactly. But like I'm still... But I, I, my Xbox is the one that I'm still sort of deleting and de re-downloading things the most on. Yeah. Do you think, um, remember when Mark Cerny was like, don't buy external storage for your PS5 because we need to pre-approve them. Has Sony ever put out a list saying these are the approved hard drives? I assume they have at some point, right? I, just, I, don't, I haven't followed that at all. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I think there's some info there, kind probably. of. Um, the, uh, is the whole idea at this point of the bullet point of the generation being, hey, goodbye loading screens, that's all gone, right? That's just, like, after playing Halo Infinite, and there's plenty of loading in that game, playing Nobody Saves the World, even though there's plenty of loading in that game, it's like, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, the idea that they tried to build that as a feature. What's it going to take? Like, the what, maybe Gran Turismo 7? I'm trying to think of, like, the next big PlayStation 5 exclusive where they can maybe push that? 
But I just feel like generationally, as an overall generation, that's just nonsense that it's a thing of the past, which it seemed like they were trying to convince us was the case on both teams. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly... pretty close. You think? I guess maybe you just didn't play Halo Infinite. Maybe just because I died so no, much, but there's a lot of loading in Halo Infinite. But I did play, um, which this isn't the same thing, because we'll see how Horizon, the new one is, but Horizon Zero Dawn, like the old game on my PS5, everyone says that the loads I experienced were like insanely quick compared to what it was on the base. Oh, interesting. And I do feel a difference when I like see older hardware load something. I'm like, God, how did I live through this? Totally. This is, again, I very privileged life. I'm like, oh, thank God we're out of there. Yeah. <laughs> but that was my biggest problem. Yeah. And it, it also, it might be in a weird way, a thing that gets better with the, as the generation goes on. Yeah. Just that because be. I'm sure it's a, just another skill that developers have to figure out of they can probably ease that a little more than you know it's not something they've had to think about in previous generations in terms of how do i get this to function instantly just right. because the hard drive is a little faster now so yeah maybe maybe it'll get better and also indie i don't know like in indie like Drinkbox studios i don't know if we can count count what they're doing yeah as so like it's a console exclusive i would have it would have been cool if there was no loading in between areas on a Series X, but what do I know? Uh, Tanner Hoisington. Also, is, oh. is your Series X okay, Hanson? No. Because what? you've you've talked about like super choppiness playing Halo Infinite or yeah. like in cinematics and stuff like that, and right. I didn't have any of that on the Xbox One X. Are you sure that your console's just not? Is it like does smoke puff out of it while it's? Yeah, the Series X smoke. <laughs> That's how you know it's good. That's what the S stands for. That's right. Uh, that's not in the console name. Tanner Hoisington. So it's a question over on Patreon. He says, hey, my other favorite gaming podcast, the Back Page Pod. Who are they? Um, <laughs> asks, occasionally, oh, they say occasionally they do a special episode where they draft games for a future mini console. They set the categories for the types of games and snake pick titles on that platform. I'd love to hear y'all, either with these characters, categories or freestyle choose the best games for the gamecube mini okay so we're making a gamecube mini uh first game's got to be on there i'm gonna go smash melee kyle you're up what's next on that gamecube uh, mini uh, wind waker okay correct jeff what do you got <laughs> i never had a gamecube <laughs> get out of here can you name get out of here with that question can you name get out. A, can you name a gamecube game <laughs> Um, uh, Mario Kart Double Dash. There we go. All right, Janet? Uh, one of the Metroid games, whatever one was there. Prime. Let's, let's go Prime 1. All right, great. Prime whatever, Janet, yeah. you got to go again. We're snake picking it. Um, fucking, uh, yeah, do you want Old Always Mansion? Beautiful Joe. Love it. Jeff them. Here we go. And I see you Googling GameCube <laughs> games right now. My mo this giant monitor has given me away. <laughs> You're so uh, busted. <laughs> Janet just said Luigi's Mansion, and now I want it on there. Okay, yeah, put, there I it, put it is. On there, yeah. It's okay, fun. Kyle, we're getting full. What else? Wow. Sunshine, Mario Sunshine. Correct. Why is it taking so long? Um, because it's already on the Switch. Because none of us know GameCube games. How except dare you? We did an entire answer. show for New Show Plus. That's all about GameCube <laughs> games. Um, yeah. I'm putting uh, Pip Mario Thousand Year Door. Okay, one more round, and then this this mini console is full. So get googling, Jeff. Um. Animal Crossing. Ooh. Okay. Good. Animal Crossing. Yep. Um. I'm gonna. Oh, there was a biggie. Uh, I'll put Tales of Symphonia on there. Let's use up that space. How many? So how many do I have uh, left? So you got one, Kyle, and Jeffum's got one. Okay, mine's Twin Snakes. Ooh, interesting but excellent choice. People in the chat are screaming, Jeffum. They're screaming Rogue Squadron. They're screaming Eternal Darkness. It's your pick for the final one, Jeffum. Don't mm. blow it. I'm going to say The Simpsons Hit and Run. Sure. <laughs> what a cool choice. There it That's is, Tanner. Exclusive. That, that was on all platforms. That is the GameCube Mini, everybody. Buy it or don't. It's your call. Uh, we also had people uh, jump in with better quest goals and stuff, which is very fun to see. Bob Buell wrote in. Um, he is doing a cool thing where every month he's trying a new type of food. So he just mm -hmm. tried uh, Korean corn dogs. And he says, hey, it gets a Bob Buell stamp of approval. Korean corn dogs, you're all right in my book, he says. There we go. That's, I think, the favorite food of Korea is uh, corn dogs. Um, Don Ruffalo writes in, um, 
just saying that he had a rough year with a lot of loss in his family, so his better quest goal is to appreciate people in his life a little bit more. Uh, to cherish every moment. So there we go, Don. That's good. Uh, Ron with two N's says, hello, Ron with two N's here. My better quest goal is to pass the semester of college. I'm a senior at one of the bigger universities here in Florida, and I just want to be done with school. I'm a plant science major. And I'm currently taking hmm. physics two, primatology, and evolutionary biology. My only goal is to pass. C's get degrees, and that is what I want. <laughs> <laughs> we believe in you, like Ron. That structure of major, I feel like you're setting yourself up to be like in the next Resident Evil game. Yes, I honestly thought of that immediately. Right? Like creating some crazy <laughs> plant boss fight. Um, all right, what do y'all like for question of the week here? I love uh, the you know old games. Returning to old games, one. Returning good. to old games. I like the best concert. Yeah, I like the yeah. music one as well. I like the house buying games infiltrating real life one. Um, I also like that because of the quirks. I like the quirks. That went places. It definitely went places. <laughs> I like the Activision seventy different billion dollar studios as a think That's piece. Um, also, I've officially wish listed Fatty Bear's birthday surprise. Oh boy! On when uh, review pending, I'll let y'all know. Okay, all right. There's I, I had that written down as like a new show plus option at some point, like humongous games. Because I think there oh, is yeah. a crazy groundswell of love for them. Um. All right. What do y'all like? Which way are we going? Concert. I like concert. I think it was the biggest talker. <gasps> okay. All right. There we go. Adam Castellanos. Congratulations. I may be able to ship you out that uh, Disco Elysium soundtrack on CD. And now it's time for something that we like to call Get a Little of This. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, everybody. Hey, get a load of this. Um, there's an article from PC Gamer. And it came out uh, last week, I believe, that Ubisoft is releasing a new game. Have you heard about their new VR game? It's called Notre Dame on Fire is the name of the game. Yes. And it is yeah, a I VR heard. co-op game where you're firefighters, but then quotes from Deborah here, the senior VP of new business, she says, like any escape game, it's a question of puzzles and cooperating with your teammates. So you're firefighters in like an escape room style VR, but it's Notre Dame Cathedral burning down and you have to stop it from burning down. Which is so bizarre because I remember it was like a big goodwill move on Ubisoft's part when Notre Dame was burning down and they said, don't worry, you can recreate it because we've scanned everything for Assassin's Creed Unity and everybody said, cool, good job Ubisoft. And now they do have like, and now we'll make a game about its destruction. <laughs> it's very weird. Well, they are trying to save it, I guess, right? I guess so, yeah. Yeah, but it feels a little too real i think yeah i don't I'm, know look it'll be a great new show plus option at some point um okay. <laughs> links below for all this fun stuff uh who wants to go next who is the second best get a load of this i here i have one i sent it to you on slack because i want oh yeah uh you you'll you'll you know you'll see the video so you'll know what it is but i want janet and jeff um hey guys get a load of this i want you to try and guess what animal this is it's it's a it's an animal being pet like they're 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 happy. Yep. Okay. And I'm gonna play it now. Bully boy, bully boy. That's a good one. Bully boy. Okay. All right. All right. Is it Kyle? <laughs> So what animal do you think that is? It's an animal being pet. They're happy. It's happy. Animals. Hang on, we can't hear you, Jan. You'll have to talk over this animal. Um, a hippopotamus? But it sounds really scary. So I feel like it's got to be... Uh, again, getting Resident Evil vibe. The baby from the house. <laughs> um, hippo is my Not the baby from the house. mission. But mm. I don't... It's got to be something more... Like, like bigger hmm. than that? Hmm. I don't know. Do you have any ideas? Uh, I'm going to say a pig. Interesting. Pig. Uh, there is a hint, if I may, in the voice of the person saying, burly boy, or whatever saying. If you listen carefully. Burly boy. Burly boy. Burly boy. He has a slight accent. Uh, Kyle, what is it, man? It's a capybara. Ready, guys? Uh, no. It is a koala. <laughs> But to be well, fair, that looking just at the ruins video, that dream, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, oh. never own or pet a koala. That's you really scary. 
it throws its head back and just makes these insane guttural noises. It's like I there's no world where I would have guessed that was a koala. It's insane. <laughs> That's stupid. Uh, Jeff, what do you got? Yeah, get a load of this. Oh. Uh, I I stole this one from the community because apparently I only read news stories this week that just pissed me off. So. Yeah. Okay. But this one came from Nick uh, from Atlanta, although it says Nick from Fantasy Critic at this point. Interesting. But apparently. Um, Fight Club just came out in China on a streaming service, but they changed the end of the movie to appease the censors. So and so now, apparently, when the movie ends, uh, I, I guess it ends with, um, you know, uh, Edward Norton kind of standing, looking out over the, the skyline. the buildings blow up, yeah. No, well, not anymore, Hanson. Instead, oh. it, fa- it fades to black, and a message comes up. And the message reads, uh, through the clue provided by Tyler... The police rapidly figured out the whole plan and arrested all criminals, successfully preventing the bomb from exploding. After the trial, Tyler was sent to lunatic asylum, receiving psychological treatment. He was discharged from the hospital in 2012. I Cue am... the Pixies music playing That's over. I was going to ask, does the Pixies still play? It's, it's now, it's, it says, <laughs> so. text comes up, we found their mind. It turns out. It's a, it's so a hell funny. of a change. I am Jack's government censorship, right, guys? <laughs> Hell. <laughs> That's uh, good. I like that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Janet, you got one? Yeah. Um, before I get a load of this, but also I just want to add to Jeffem's thing with um, that was giving like vibes of um, Poochie's gone to another <laughs> Right, like, totally. Like, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, Poochie's sad. Yay. Okay. Um, this is actually a really old article, but I didn't come across it until like, a, you know, like pretty recently on, on TikTok, someone explaining like this phenomenon. Uh, it comes from the New York Times. It's called For Creators, Everything is for Sale. And it's an article that it ends up talking about a, a couple ways that creators monetize things and their their personal lives and who they are but one really interesting angle is this new platform i don't think it's available yet who knows if it's ever gonna like fully come to fruition called new new that (laughs) is supposed to be like it has polls and people can like pay money to like control your life so basically they they pitch this as a it's called patreon uh, choose your own adventure an irl choose your own adventure it's like choose your adventure games but these are real people like do I go to Target or CVS today and then you pay and you and then I do it. So I'm like out mm. there living it's like if until dawn, but I was in like for I existed for real. <laughs> I'm kind and then of I'm into like, that. what do I do? Um so yeah, I don't know. I don't know why all mine are like weird capitalist dystopian ones, but that's what I usually see yeah. on the internet. So that's I'll good. try to find some weird animal for next week. It'd be nice. I mean mine was kind of capitalist dystopian too, I think. Mine was too. <laughs> well, that it was honestly scarier than I ever imagined it could be. <laughs> uh, did you pull one from the community, Jeff? Oh, get a load of this to continue capitalist dystopia. Oh, interesting. Uh, this one is from Neuroflare, okay? He shared an article from Jeff Grubb on VentureBeat. That article was about a YouTube video, and so that's what I'm officially sharing. The video is from Folding Ideas, a YouTube channel. Uh-huh. Uh, it's called Line Goes Up, The Problem with NFTs. Oh, right. Um, the guy... The guy who created it is Dan Olson. He does super good work, um, and you should check him out just in general. But he put together a two-hour and 18-minute kind of breakdown of what NFTs are. And I think the the thing that Olson is really good at is kind of providing context for understanding things in, you know, in like different industries and different, you know, like media and things like that. But he kind of – he starts this breakdown of – Bitcoin and Ethereum and eventually into NFTs by comparing it to the housing market in 2008 right. and how it's really just like these huge capitalists, you know, like venture capitalists and stuff funding their own wealth and turning that into a huge scam to scam normal people off. And it it's an exhaustive breakdown, but it's super fascinating and people should check it out. If even if you even if you already knew that NFTs are scams, which we all do, it really goes into all the problems with bitcoins and blockchains and all of that stuff, um, and explains it super well. I, I watched that entire thing and I was very confused for a lot of it. Still, I know I said in the podcast like I don't yeah. understand NFTs and all that stuff, and then a lot of people sent it my way, and I, I watched it. And I guess the takeaway is just okay. So the reason this is happening in a big way is because everyone who is into NFTs they need to keep pushing NFTs so they're worth more. So that's where that whole pyramid Ponzi scheme angle comes because it has and, to be propelled and. I don't know. Everybody who buys into it needs to be a proponent to it because then they're 
but then they're not trustworthy messengers for why it's important. Because if they convince you that it's important, then their investment's worth more. And and also just like as a as a vehicle to continue propping up like Bitcoin and Ethereum and like all of these blockchains, like you 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 need people to buy into it. Like that's like NFTs get people right. to buy the currency in order to make the NFTs and then to buy the NFTs and then hopefully sell them later for more money than you bought them. But that's never going to happen for lots and lots of reasons. So, yeah, we didn't get into any predictions, but what do you think GameStop's going to do with NFTs since they're ramping up in a big way? What do you think that will look like this year? Oh, they're, they're probably going to spend all their money on NFTs and then selling them. They're going to spend their money on selling out, them out of business. Well, I mean, they'll probably just take the Konami approach and just sell like a bunch of video game themed NFTs. But they can't because they need like the publishers. Even like if they're trying to sell. They don't though. That's the problem with the NFTs really. It's like they can be whatever you want. <laughs> they're not They're not like, they're not under any sort of uh, government standards or, or rules really. Ultimately. Really? I mean, obviously you don't want to like use uh, uh, trademarked images and stuff like that. But like, I don't, and I don't think a major corporation would, but like, you're not going to get in a lot of trouble for doing that. So you think they're going to sell like a Game Informer poster from issue 123? Yeah, probably. As an NFT? Like, what else would they do? That's what I understand. Like, they're going to try and partner with publishers and publishers would be like, wait, wait, why would we partner with GameStop for selling NFTs? I don't understand it. They're, they're probably not going to do anything. They, I think they saw that NFT is a big word that everybody's throwing around and they'll probably... They'll make their own coin or something and then explode. It's gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be like the little <laughs> bunny on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> I completely forgot about that power up bunny or whatever. How oh, could you forget about the power up bunny? Wait, I don't know what you're all what the is GameStop this? mascot? Google? It's what's its name? Like Buckers or something? GameStop. I'm scared to see oh. this. His name is Buck? Who is Buck? Yeah, Buck Bunny. Yeah. Come uh, on, Janet. Don't be what? naive. We all, we're all big fans. I have never seen this man before. I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I've never seen this man before in my life. Um, Okay. I don't know what to do with this information now. Well, buy an NFT. That's what you do with the information. Um, We're selling Buck Bunny, everybody. Uh, Hey, anyways, uh, we have some things to plug. Uh, Next week, we're going to be uh, shaking some things up at MinMax. I don't think anybody should be worried, Um, but we're relaunching some shows. We're maybe launching some new shows. So everybody tune in. This should be an exciting time. Um, Just a heads up that's tangentially related to that is there won't be a call-in episode of MinMax Council. Normally, it's the last Sunday of every month. That is not going to be the case. And you might want to tune in Monday for maybe a kind of new angle for MinMax Council, which is our Patreon-exclusive podcast. It should be a fun one, so look forward to that, everybody. But on this last episode of MinMax Council, Kyle was on, and we talked about even more about Activision Blizzard, shared some more lingering thoughts we've had. We talked about Max Payne 3. We shared our top three Coen Brother movies. We talked about Macbeth. We talked about Book of Boba Fett, The Halo Show. Sweet Home on Netflix, the, the South Korean horror That's TV right. show. That's right. We talked about Cheer on Netflix as well. Uh, so there's a lot packed into that episode of MinMax Council. So for everybody who's enjoying our bonus podcast that we've been doing for New Show Plus, MinMax Council is also a bonus podcast we do every week and it's about to get a lot better so stay tuned everybody we appreciate it also uh get ready for the deepest dive i'm pokemon legends arceus that's going to be happening next week you can support us at any tier if you want to support the game club format moving forward and submit a comment and unlock the podcast version and all of that fun stuff all right that's it for this episode of the podcast everybody Thank you so much for watching and listening. Uh, thank you to people who support us over on Patreon, including DX Racer, who sent over a DX Racer Air Series Gamer Chair. Uh, so shout out to them. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you to everybody who supported us at the $50 tier. We have Ted Riser, DivergeCoffee.com, Fixture Gaming's Fixture S1, I am 8-Bit, Zachary Pligge, Ludwig Roque, Andrew Yukowicz, Drew Waranis, Andrew Valla, Beaten Elm Brian, PrettyGoodPrinting.com, John Higby, Lord of the Rings Card Game, Mr. Nomer. By the way, Jeff, um, next week? Maybe there'll be a change to how we're doing all these names here. So look alive, everybody. Uh, Mr. Nomer, Joar, hello. Ron with two N's, Steve Bamdad, Clement Zobel, Purebred number six, Star Killer, Spider Dan, Preetham Yar Legata, General Lady 99, and Chris. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, be good. Have fun. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> you blew it. I blew it. <laughs>